Uh, well, I declare open this hearing of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics uh, for the review of the Reserve Bank of Australia Annual Report 2021. I welcome representatives of the Reserve Bank as well as members of the public and the media watching the webcast. In recent years, with the COVID-19 pandemic challenging economies and markets around the world, the importance of monetary policy for the Australian economy has never been more evident. The decisions of the RBA impact all Australians. At its meeting on 6 September, the RBA board decided to increase the cash rate target by 50 basis points to 2.35% and the interest rate on exchange settlement balances by 50 basis points to 2.25%. It also committed to returning inflation to the 2 to 3% range over time. This is the first public hearing of this uh, economics committee for this term. So I think it's very fitting uh, that the RBA is the first organisation to be in front of us. And I thank uh, the senior members of the RBA for making the time to uh, travel down to Canberra today. In accordance with the committee's resolution of 9 August 2022, uh, this hearing will be broadcast on the parliament's website and the proof and official transcripts of the proceedings will be published on the parliament's website. Uh, those present here today are advised that filming and recording by the media are permitted during the hearing. I remind members of the media who may be present or listening of the need to fairly and accurately report the proceedings of the committee. I welcome representatives from the Reserve Bank of Australia appearing for today's hearing. For the benefit of Hansard, could you each please state your full names and the capacity in which you appear before the committee? Uh, Philip Lowe, Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Michelle Bullock, Deputy Governor. Lucy Ellis, Assistant Governor Economic. Brad Jones, Assistant Governor Financial System. Thanks very much. I remind you that although the committee does not require you to give evidence under oath, the hearings are legal proceedings of the parliament and warrant the same respect as proceedings of the house. The giving of false or misleading evidence is a serious matter and may be regarded as a contempt of parliament. Mr Lowe, I invite you to make an opening statement. Thank you and uh, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you very much for holding this hearing. At the Reserve Bank, we take these he hearings very seriously. They're a critical part of the accountability process for the Reserve Bank of Australia, and my colleagues and I are committed to answering your questions as openly and transparently as we can. The previous hearing was held back in early February. As you would know, a lot's changed since then. And I'd like to highlight three changes in particular. The first is the decline in unemployment. The second is the surge in inflation. And the third is the earlier and sharper than expected increase in interest rates. In February, the unemployment rate stood at 4.2%. Today, it's 3.5%. This is the lowest unemployment rate in almost 50 years. Labor force participation has also <coughs> increased, so that a higher share of working age Australians have a job today than ever before. And underemployment is lower too, as people who work part-time are finding it easy to get the hours they want. I wanted to start by recounting these facts, because the improvement in the Australian labor market is a very ma significant, it's a major achievement. Australians are finding it easier to get a job than they have in a long time. Young people and women are benefiting most from this and they have greater opportunities. Our economy and our society is stronger as a result. In contrast, the second change since February, the increase in inflation, is an unwelcome one. When the previous committee met in February, underlying inflation in Australia had just reached the midpoint of the 2 to 3% range for the first time in many years. Seven months on, we're in a very different position. Inflation has very quickly gone from being too low to being too high. Over the year to June, the headline inflation rate was 6.1%. It's expected to increase further over the months ahead and to peak around 7.75% later this year. Inflation's then expected to start declining to be back around 3% the, in uh, the end of 2024. As you would know, global factors explain much of this increase in inflation. Russia's invasion of Ukraine resulted in major disruptions to energy markets around the world, increasing retail energy prices in many countries. And COVID-related interruptions to global production are still rippling through global supply chains and it's pushing prices up. 
the demand for goods in global markets has been very strong over the past few years as people switch from spending on services to spending on goods. The result of impaired supply and strong demand has been higher prices around the world and we've felt that here in Australia. But important as these global factors have been, they are not the full story for why inflation is high in Australia at the moment. Demand here has been very strong relative to the capacity of our econom economy to meet that demand. This is clearly evident in the labour market where the number of job vacancies is at a record high and firms are finding it quite difficult to hire workers. There are also capacity constraints in many sectors, including in the building of infrastructure and in the housing industry. This strong demand is in part a result of the policy approach during the pandemic. During 2020 and 2021, both fiscal and monetary policy provided very considerable economic support for households and businesses. At the RBA, we did this to provide a financial bridge to the day when the virus was contained and to provide some insurance against the possibility of very bad economic outcomes in the country. I think as we sit here in Canberra today, it can be easy to forget how dire the outlook was in 2020. There were credible predictions that the unemployment rate would reach 15%. Spending in the economy was collapsing. Our hospitals were expected to be overflowing and a vaccine seemed to be years away. It was a scary time, a very scary time. In that environment, the Reserve Bank Board wanted to do what it could to help and to shore up confidence. We're also seeking to provide some economic insurance against the worst possible outcomes. In the event, vaccines were developed in record time and our economy with the support of monetary and fiscal policy proved to be very resilient. We did avoid the dire outcomes that many thought likely. And today, many people are returning back to their pre-pandemic way of life and they're spending again, including on travel and on services. And we saw further evidence of this last week in the national accounts with the Australian economy growing by 0.9% in the June quarter and by 3.6% over the year. These are good outcomes and they're better than those being recorded in most other economies. Given the resilience of our economy and the surge in inflation, it is understandable that some people are questioning whether or not too much support was provided by the RBA over the past two years. And judgments on this issue will inevitably differ. But in those dark days of the pandemic, the Reserve Bank Board judged that the bigger policy mistake would have been to do too little rather than too much. If we'd done too little and the worst had occurred, Australians would have paid a heavy price. As things turned out, thankfully, the worst was avoided. So it has been appropriate to unwind the very easy monetary conditions that were put in place during the pandemic and to address the higher inflation that's emerged so quickly. This brings me to the third change since February, and that's the increase in interest rates from the extraordinarily low levels during the pandemic. Since May, the cash rate has been increased by a cumulative two and a quarter percentage points, and it now stands at 2.35%. Like the rise in inflation, this increase in interest rates has come sooner and has been larger and faster than was previously expected. Previously, the RBA had forecast that the damaging effects of the pandemic on our economy would be long lasting, and that as a result, inflation would stay low. And on that basis, we had expected that interest rates would remain low for some years. I'm frequently reminded that many people interpreted our previous communication as a promise or as a commitment that interest rates would not increase until 2024. This was despite our statements on interest rates always being conditional on the state of the economy. And this conditionality often got lost in the messaging. So we're currently working through the implications of this for our future approach, approach to forward guidance and for communication more generally. But now that inflation is as high as it is, we need to make sure that inflation returns to target in a reasonable time. A really powerful lesson from history is that low and stable inflation is a prerequisite for a strong economy and a sustained period of full employment. High inflation damages our economy it worsens inequality and it devalues people's savings. High inflation also makes it very difficult to sustain or increase real wages, so it's a scourge. 
It's for these reasons that the RBA is committed to returning inflation to the 2 to 3 per cent target range over time. Now, I know that higher interest rates are unwelcome for many people, especially those who have borrowed large sums over recent times. Higher interest rates are putting pressure on household budgets just at the time that higher petrol prices and grocery bills are also squeezing budgets. So it's a difficult and a concerning time for many people. The alternative though, of allowing higher inflation to become entrenched would be even more difficult and it would damage Australia's longer term <coughs> economic prospects. So the RBA will do what's necessary to make sure that the higher inflation does not become entrenched and we are committed to returning inflation to the 2 to 3 per cent target range. And we're seeking to do this in a way that keeps the economy on an even keel. I think it is possible to achieve this, but the path here is a narrow one and it's clouded in uncertainty. One important source of uncertainty at the moment is the global economy where the outlook has deteriorated. The situation in Europe is very troubling not least because of the extraordinary increase in energy prices. And in the United States, the Federal Reserve has indicated that monetary policy will need to become restrictive to get inflation to come back down. And the Chinese economy is also facing major challenges due to the combination of COVID, a severe drought in parts of the country, and very weak conditions in the property market. I think it will be difficult for Australia to stay on the narrow path to a soft landing if there is a further material bad news on the global economy. Another factor that will determine how successfully we navigate that narrow path is how inflation expectations and the general inflation psychology evolve in Australia. To date, medium term inflation expectations have been well anchored and that's good news. But the general inflation psychology does appear to be shifting. It's easy for firms to put their prices up and the public is more accepting of this. Wage growth has also picked up from the very low rates of recent years and a further increase is expected due to the very tight labour market. Stronger wage growth is something that the RBA had been seeking for a number of years and some pickup is very welcome. It's also important to note that to date, the stronger growth in wages has not been a factor driving inflation higher. And at the aggregate level, growth in labour cost remains consistent with inflation returning to target. That's not the case in a number of other countries, but it is the case in Australia. Looking forward now, it is important that we avoid a cycle where higher inflation leads to higher wages and inflation remaining high. This type of cycle would lead to higher interest rates, a weaker economy and higher unemployment. Businesses too have a role in avoiding these damaging outcomes by not using the higher inflation as a cover for an increase in their profit margins. A third issue that we're watching carefully is household spending. Consumer spend, uh, sentiment has fallen recently, household disposable income is under pressure from higher inflation and higher interest rates, and housing prices are declining after the earlier large gains. On the other hand, many households are benefiting from the strong labour market, including by finding jobs and getting more hours of work. And some households are also continuing to save at a higher rate than before the pandemic, and quite a few have built up large financial buffers over the past couple of years, although many other households have very, own, very limited financial buffers. In the face of these competing factors, the recent data suggests that household spending has remained resilient so far. Again, that's good news. There is though considerable uncertainty as to how these various factors will balance out over the months ahead, and we're watching the situation very carefully. In terms of the outlook for interest rates, the Reserve Bank Board expects that further increases will be required to bring inflation back to target. We're not on a preset path though, especially given the uncertainties that I've just spoken about. The increase in interest rates has been rapid and it's been global. And we know that monetary policy operates with a lag. At some point, it will be appropriate to slow the rate of increase in interest rates and the case for doing that becomes stronger as the level of interest rates increases. But as I said previously, the size and the timing of future interest rate increases will be guided by the incoming data and the board's assessment of the outlook for inflation and the labour market. On a different matter, as you would know, the government has recently commissioned a review into Australia's monetary policy arrangements and the Reserve Bank. Both the board and the bank staff welcome this review 
and we have already had constructive discussions with the review panel. And we look forward to discussing with this committee the topics raised by the review at this and future hearings. To complement the external review, the RBA is undertaking internal reviews into the three-year yield target, the bond purchase program, and our approach to forward guidance. The yield target review was published in June and the review of bond purchase of the bond purchase program will be published next week and the forward guidance will re review will be published um, late in the year. Finally, um, since this is the first hearing of this committee under the 47th Parliament, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the RBA's other responsibilities. We are the banker to the Commonwealth Government. We operate the official public account and we're the government's main transactional banker, providing banking services to the ATO, Services Australia, and many government departments. Over the past couple of years, we played a really important role in making the COVID-related and flood disaster payments <coughs> in real time. We made sure that people received their money quickly, often on weekends and outside of normal business hours. We're also responsible for the core of Australia's payment system, which allows money to move from one bank account to another. As part of this work, we operate the centre of Australia's real-time fast payment system, which makes it possible for money to move between bank accounts in a matter of seconds at any time of the day or week. We also print the nation's banknotes. While cash is being used less and less frequently for transactions, there is still very strong demand for banknotes. On average, there are 18 $100 bills out there for, uh, for every single person in Australia, 18 $100 bills, and there are 38 $50 bills. The total value on notes on issue at the moment is $102 billion, which is, averages out to $4,000 per person in the country. That's a high figure. There's still strong demand for our banknotes, even though they're not being used in transactions. The RBA has important regulatory responsibilities in the payment system, which are overseen by the Payment System Board. We supervise the central counterparties that are operated by the ASX, and at, uh, these are at the heart of Australia's financial market infrastructure. We also have regulatory responsibilities for efficiency, competition and stability in Australia's retail payment system. And one issue that we're currently examining closely is the public interest case for the RBA to issue a digital form of the Australian dollar, which would complement the physical banknotes that we currently issue. And we have an open mind as to whether it will be in the public interest to do this. And we're currently working with the Digital Finance Cooperative Research Centre on potential use cases. And we're also working very closely with other central banks around the world on this important issue. So thank you very much. Uh, my colleagues and, he, and I are here to answer your questions on any of this material. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, I feel that for the full disclosure of my financial interests, I should disclose that I have less than 18 $100 bills on my person at the moment. <laughs> so do I. I don't know um, many people who do. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think you've set the scene well in terms of the uncertainty which the uh, RBA faced and other central banks at the depths of the COVID recession and, and the uh, lockdowns that, that societies faced and the fact that you were making decisions are having to juggle a number of possible scenarios. And I think you've framed that in terms of uh, having to think about how much insurance you would take out. And if you took out too much insurance, that would have consequences, but there were reasons at the time to err on that side. In a sense, um, you're, you're making decisions now in the face of uncertainty as well, albeit a very different set of uh, uncertainties. And in a sense, like other central banks, uh, I would imagine you, what you're trying to do is to return the economy to the two to 3% inflation band, but without overshooting on interest rates and, and um, causing too much of a, a downturn and, and negative consequences in the economy. So in that context, I'm just interested um, and you've, you've touched on some, some of these, but what, what do you see as some of the uh, current risks in the global economy? Um, so, for example, in the US, uh, we have uh, a number of commentators talking about uh, an elevated chance of the US entering um, recession. We have a number of issues in the UK, oh, sorry, the EU in particular, around energy markets. Um, and, and obviously in China, there's a whole range of issues in their property markets and also um, in, in relation to um, lockdowns. I'm just curious as to how you view some of those global risks. Yeah, thank you. Well, the, um, there are th three big issues and, and um, you've just touched on them there. The, 
In the US, inflation is um, too high and the Federal Reserve is saying they're going to require interest rates to become restrictive and the economy to slow quite considerably to get inflation to come back down again. Uh, in large part, they're saying that because wages growth has already moved there. In the United States, wages are growing at five, five or six percent at the moment, and that's not consistent with inflation averaging two percent. So in the United States, wages growth is going to have to slow, and the, the judgment of most people at the moment is that's going to require a slowing in the US economy and thus much higher interest rates. And if the US economy slows, that will inevitably affect the rest of the world. The Federal Reserve is uh, intent on communicating, messaging that they will do what's necessary, the same as us, because they want to stop this lift in inflation expectations being fed through into higher wages and higher prices. So they're grappling with the same issues um, that we are. But as I said there in my introductory um, remarks, we're in a much better position because wages growth in Australia is still consistent with the inflation target. I think in the US it's not. That's a significant issue. Uh, in Europe, uh, well, in, in the United Kingdom, wages growth is five or six percent, so they've got to they've got to find a way to get that back down uh, as well. But there's a, a broader issue in Europe, and that's the decline in people's real incomes. In most European countries, inflation is close to ten percent. In the UK, it'll be um, in double digits soon. So inflation's ten, wages somewhere between three and five, depending whether which, which country you're looking at. So people's real incomes are being cut by five, six, seven per cent. When your real income's being cut by that amount, your ability to spend is diminished. And if household spending uh, isn't there, then firms won't want to invest. So I think the, the higher energy prices in Europe are really hurting household spending ability and they're making the investment environment more uncertain. So that's a a clear and pressing danger for the European economy. And in China, they're still persisting with their, uh, uh, essentially the COVID zero policy, uh, and they're having to have these intermediate lockdowns in cities, and that's interrupting production capability and also the uh, incentive for Chinese citizens to spend because you never know when another lockdown is going to come. So spending in the Chinese economy is weak. The other part of the Chinese economy that's weak at the moment is uh, the housing sector. A number of large property developers have collapsed and they're not currently completing projects that they'd previously committed to. And so households are unwilling to commit to buy residential property in China because they're unsure whether the developer will finish the project. So the property <laughs> sector is very weak and um, I know the Chinese authorities are trying to support the local governments to complete projects to give people confidence that if you buy something off the plan, it will be completed. But they're struggling to generate the confidence there. So that's a rather long answer. But um, the US has got significant issues because they've got to get inflation down. In Europe, the decline in real incomes for households is a very major issue. And in China, the housing market is. Um, is problematic. So you put all that together and the, the outlook for the global economy next year is, is quite weak. And if it were to weaken further from our current forecast, it'll be difficult for, for us to navigate this narrow path of getting inflation down while having um, our economy continue to grow reasonably well. Up. Another challenge with the narrow path is that uh, it's been observed by a number of commentators that when you increase interest rates, the impacts in the real economy can take some time to <coughs> materialise. So you've, you've now uh, increased interest rates by 50 basis points a number of times. So how does that affect the timing and magnitude of future uh, interest rate rises when um, you might still, in a sense, be waiting to, to see the full effects of interest rate rises that are already in the system? Yeah, but as I said in my introductory remarks, the fact that we've raised interest rates quite, quite a lot already um, increases the strength of the argument for smaller increases going forward. We were <coughs> having interest rates at essentially zero. That became inappropriate because the economy was resilient, inflation was high. So we needed to move fairly quickly to get interest rates back to a more normal setting. We're closer to a normal setting now, which means that the case for large adjustments in interest rates is diminished. 
I think at our next board meeting, we'll be considering uh, whether it's a 25 basis point increase or a 50 basis point increase. Uh, I think it's likely we'll increase rates again and that will be the discussion we, we're having and it will really come down to uh, how we view the balance of these risks that we've been talking about, what's going on in the global economy, how price and wage setting behaviour is adjusting here and how household spending is responding. Uh, but as interest rates get higher, it's kind of a, it's common sense that the need for big adjustments gets smaller. All those constant doesn't, but all those often isn't constant. Things are changing all the time. But um, um, at, at some point, we'll obviously um, not need be increasing rates by 50 basis points at each meeting, and we're getting closer to that point. You're, you're obviously having to constantly <coughs> update your. Um, modelling, and, and as you alluded to in your introductory comments, you know we had some labour force figures uh, announced recently where unemployment was still at a low number, uh, albeit that it had increased slightly. But um, you know total employment had increased, and underemployment remains quite low. I'm just wondering, you, you know, we've had a few uh, data releases recently. Yeah. We've had our labour force figures, um, and we've had U.S. inflation coming in higher than expected, which obviously had a big impact on equity markets. So, what's your overall take on? Um, some of the uh, data releases in recent days and, and whether that has upside or downside implications? Well, the, the, the data on the Australian economy continues to suggest our economy is doing very well. The number of job ads at the moment is at a record high. Our firms tell us through our liaison program that it's incredibly difficult to hire workers. Job ads and um, job vacancies is extraordinarily high. The latest data that we have on retail spending uh, was, was again pretty firm and we have um, high frequency data from the banks and the card companies about the current um, growth in spending and it continues to suggest that spending in the economy is uh, pretty strong. So spending strong, firms want to hire workers, workers are getting jobs and they're getting more hours. So the um, the uh, NAB business survey, um, I think it was earlier this week, again showed businesses are confident. And the counterbalance to all this is consumer confidence is very, very weak. <coughs> We're in this environment at the moment where consumer confidence is weak, but people keep spending. Partly it's because the saving rate's still high, so people have the ability to smooth through the um, weaker, weaker um, growth in real incomes. That, but it's a, one of the puzzles at the moment. Spending is strong, but consumer sentiment is quite weak. How long that lasts for, it's hard to know. So the last question on your overarching take <clears throat> on the current situation is, what's your central forecast for the likely um, uh, overall impact on average housing prices across Australia? Well, we don't, I don't, um, we don't really have kind of forecasts of housing prices. It's so, it's so hard to forecast asset prices, isn't it? But prices went up 25% over the past two years. Very, very big increase. It would not surprise me, and this is not a forecast, but it would not surprise me if prices came down by a cumulative 10%. And even if they did that, they're still up 15% you know, over three years. So. It's, it's hard to know and, uh, you know, as I said, I, we don't want to forecast housing prices because you know, it's very, very difficult to do. But um, as interest rates rise further, and they will rise further, <coughs> I'd expect uh, more heat to come out of the housing market and prices to come down further. We've got to remember prices went up 25% in two years. Now, a while ago, sorry, people were complaining the housing prices were rising too quickly. So as a society, we're either complaining prices are going up or going <coughs> down. I just had a couple yeah. of questions yeah. now, uh, looking back at um, some of the policies that the Reserve Bank implemented uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so, so one, I just had a couple of questions around forward guidance, uh, and, and you've uh, talked in your um, introductory comments about the fact that, um, you know, at, at no point did you make a, a guarantee in relation to uh, where interest, where the cash rate would be. Uh, and if you look back at um, some of your specific comments. Um, for example, um, in October 2020, uh, we do not expect <clears throat> to be increasing the cash rate for at least three years. Um, and in uh, September 2021, you said our judgment is that this condition for a lift in the cash rate will not be met before 2024. And in November 16, you said it is still plausible uh, that the first yeah. increase in the cash rate 
will not be before 2024. So each of those statements does, uh, as you've identified, have um, a caveat in it, uh, has, has conditionality. Um, I'm just curious though, in terms of lessons learned and the way that forward guidance might be implemented uh, in the future, it does seem as though notwithstanding those caveats, some in both wholesale markets and in the broader community yep. focused more on the, the date rather than the conditionality. I'm just wondering if, if two questions. Yep. One is, if forward guidance was to be used in the future, would it be best to have a shorter horizon? And, and secondly, would it be best to use vaguer language? So rather than putting a specific date out there to, to use language like, you know, for some time. Yep. Uh, well, they're very good questions, and the Reserve Bank Board is going to have a full review of um, the experience of the past couple of years. It's a November meeting, and we'll, I'll have more to say later in the year on um, how we're going to do this going forward. But perhaps I can just outline for you our general approach. We start off providing forecasts of the economy. People expect us to provide forecasts. Those forecasts always have a lot of caveats, but rightly, the community expects us to to put our central forecast out there. So we do that. The next thing we do is try and explain our reaction function, uh, how we're going to move interest rates in response to various variables. So we put forecasts out there and hopefully people understand our reaction function. And up until the pandemic, people would then draw their implications for what that meant for the timing of interest rate increases. So that's how it worked, um, has worked for a long period of time. During the pandemic, we put our forecast together with our reaction function to be very explicit about what we thought that meant about the timing of interest rate increases. So that was quite different. In the past, we left judgments about timing to be drawn by the market and by the community. Uh, during the pandemic, for better or worse, we took the, the extra step of putting the forecast together with the reaction function and making explicit statements about timing, even though they were caveated. Uh, some people think that was a mistake, but uh, and it may well have been, but what we were trying to do there was to send a very strong message to the community that the Reserve Bank would do what was necessary to keep the economy uh, uh, as strong as it could be. It was a scary, it was a difficult time, and we wanted to use every instrument in our toolkit to provide support for the country. We wanted to provide insurance against the possibility of a very bad outcome. We thought that one way we could do that was to be more explicit about what our forecasts and our reaction function meant for the timing of interest rate increases. It was, it was a unique period in our economic history and our, the communication responded to that. And we wanted people to understand that we thought the pandemic was going to be damaging to our economy, but the Reserve Bank would be there with you. We would keep interest rates low for however long it was necessary to get us through this. So just, just on that yep. very issue, yep. uh, and I think you've said that, you know, you wanted to communicate to the community yep. very clearly. Yep. Um, it, what, one thing that struck me is that um, ordinarily the, the running through the, uh, uh, the, the details of Reserve Bank statements might be something you expect bond traders would do and people in wholesale markets. It did strike me that, um, particularly at this time, uh, people in the community were uh, following very closely uh, the statements of the, the Reserve Bank. So you had both wholesale markets following it and indeed interna international um, markets and people in the community. And, and since, um, you know, in recent times, a lot of people in the community have said that they acted in reliance upon that. So I'm just interested, how do you uh, assess the, the ways in which um, people are relying or uh, acting upon your statements in uh, what you might call retail markets or in the broader community uh, and wholesale markets? And, and that might be different, of course. Well, I, I'm not, I mean, when people are taking their individual decisions, they're drawing information from a whole range of sources. They um, would draw um, information from what the Reserve Bank says, but we're only one voice out there. So, uh, but I do note that um, over recent years, a lot of people took out fixed rate loans. In most years in the past, ten, only 10% 10 of the population, less than 10% of the population taking out a mortgage, take out a fixed rate loan. During the pandemic years, that went to almost 50%. Yeah, 
the flow of new loans, almost 50% of them were fixed rate loans and people were taking out often two and three year fixed rate loans. And that was partly because of, I think, our communication uh, that the fixed rates for three years were very low because of our various policy measures. So people did respond sensibly in taking out fixed rate loans during that period. So uh, they were prepared to go and buy property or undertake other investments uh, because they could get fixed rate money for three years. We'll see the um, other side of that starting kind of next year when those fixed rate ro loans roll off. But uh, people did no doubt um, take heed of what we said and we wanted them to because the, the, the well the community took the message that interest rates were going to stay low for a long period of time our underlying message was the reserve bank would be standing with the community to do what was necessary to support the economy we thought that meant interest rates <coughs> were going to stay low for a long period of time uh, that hasn't turned out to be the case and it's because we've done done well but the the message in through, particularly through 2020, but also into 2021, was always the difficult times. The central bank will be there to support the community and will do whatever's necessary to support you. But the, um, and the fact that people were, it, it appears, uh, yep. relying on it, as you say, a number of sources, but this was yep. a key one. Um, I mean, it does highlight the, the importance of the way in which statements are, are framed. Yep. Um, and it, sorry, can I just make one other um, comment in kind of response <coughs> to your previous question, we did, we, we drew together the forecast of the reaction function for the timing of interest rate increases. That was a, in a unique period in our history, I will be much less inclined to do that in the future. But I still think it was the right thing to do in that time. Others disagree with that because, but I don't think it's kind of going to be part of the regular way we're operating. And as you suggest, um, our language about the timing will be, will be vaguer as, as I've tried to be today. But on the other hand, people want clarity, don't they? So there's, you know, we're in a difficult position often because people say, well, what, what, what are interest rates going to be in a year's time? We don't know, but what we can give you is our forecast and our reaction function, and then you'll have to make your own judgments about that. Now, you've um, <clears throat> you know, highlighted the fact that there's been some soul searching, um, and, and one of the uh, <clears throat> areas where there's been soul searching is in relation to forecast misses, but as you've pointed out, <clears throat> you weren't alone in uh, not correctly yep. forecasting inflation. And I think it's you know, well known uh, that you know, forecasting is difficult at the best of times, but um, trying to forecast turning points in particular is extremely difficult. But what have you done uh, in light of that initial soul searching um, and, and perhaps in conversations with other forecasters to strengthen models? Yeah, maybe I'll, can I ask Lucy because um, to talk about that, I'll just before she does that, I'll just remind you that um, in, in August um, last year, most central banks thought that inflation in 2022 would be between two and two and a half percent. And that was the consensus amongst the professional forecasting community. So they thought this year inflation would be two, two and a half. Yet in almost every country in Europe, it's eight, nine, 10, 11. The US it's nine, Canada it's eight. So everyone has got this wrong. And the Reserve Bank has got it wrong as well. And when we make forecast errors of this magnitude, it's incumbent upon us all to look back and ask, what could we have done differently? What do we learn about that? And we're currently going through a process, the Reserve Bank, to understand why we made such a big forecast error and how we can improve our processes. But if it's OK, Lucy could um, yeah, talk, sure. talk about that a bit. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Phil. Uh, because it is you know, impossible to forecast perfectly, uh, we always have a process uh, where we evaluate our, our past forecasts, uh, take lessons from that, and we report that to the board each November. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, this is our normal process of reflection and re-evaluation, uh, but it is something that we'll be doing uh, with uh, extreme vigour this time uh, because of the scale of the forecast errors that we've had, you know, not just o over the course of the last 12 months, but over the course of the pandemic and making sure we understand uh, how to interpret the shocks that um, come through. One of the perspectives that we're taking in that analysis uh, is that uh, we're trying to disentangle the pieces that you can't possibly forecast. So, you know, no, we didn't forecast that Russia would invade Ukraine when it did. So you can't really sort of say, well, we should have forecast that. 
Uh, and so the question is how much of the forecast miss is due to those genuinely unforecastable events versus our lack of you know, complete understanding of what the implications of that event were once it had already happened. And so, for example, we were, we were correct in understanding that that event uh, meant that gas prices in Europe in particular would increase, that they would increase more than in Asia and increase more and, and in turn more than domestically because the gas markets globally are not fully uh, connected and so there's not pure price arbitrage. So we knew that. But what we didn't fully understand is that the uh, transmission through coal prices was going to have uh, a whole range of effects on our own electricity market. So our initial assessment of what this would mean for electricity prices domestically was not quite right. So you know, they're the sort of things, you know, should we have understood uh, those dynamics in the electricity market better? That's just one example. Mm. Um, you know, I could also, I just wanted to you know, roll, roll back to where we were in you know, August or November forecast rounds last year. As Phil mentioned, everybody was expecting inflation to be at best in the bottom half of the you know, two to three percent range, two to two and a half. And you look at the range of private sector forecasters during that period, that's exactly where they were. We were right in the middle of everyone else's forecasts. Uh, if anything, we were a little more bullish on GDP in some of those forecast rounds and people were poo-pooing us uh, for that. So, you know, I don't think we were any better or any worse in understanding those things. But think where we were in, in August. You know, two of the major cities were still in lockdown. Uh, the vaccine, the vaccine, um, vaccine campaign was not going particularly quickly at that point. Uh, we had genuine doubt uh, about whether we would be sort of out of lockdown, lockdown world anytime soon. Uh, so our August forecast did have, you know, did assume that there would be further lockdowns elsewhere in Australia at some point during 2022. That was built into our forecast. Maybe not four to five months, but uh, we assumed that there would be further restrictions elsewhere in the economy. Now that didn't happen. And of course, you know, Omicron hadn't happened at that point. No, you know, it didn't emerge till late November. Uh, and so, you know, the epidemiology of what happened uh, was not something we could forecast. So these are all things that we're looking for. The other thing we're doing is we're increasingly using new data sets. So uh, there's been, you know, actually some material improvements in our approach, particularly to near term forecasting. Uh, we published a bullet article a couple of quarters ago about our new consumption tracker. So we're actually getting a lot better. <coughs> at forecasting consumption than we used to be because we just have a lot more sources of near-term information and that's worked out particularly well. But you know, whether it's you know, the payments data that the governor um, mentioned earlier, our liaison, we're using, we've always had our liaison program for 21 years. We released a bulletin article talking about that yesterday. Uh, we've, we've been using that very systematically to make sure that our various sources of um, information are being triangulated appropriately. But in the end, the question is how much of this was a, we couldn't have predicted that Russia would invade Ukraine, we couldn't have predicted that Omicron would uh, emerge. Those are things that you can't predict versus here are things that we maybe could have understood better once those events had happened. And that's really the question that we're posing to ourselves and we'll be reporting to the board in November. Thanks a lot. Now, uh, I've got some more questions, but I, I'll wait to see if there's time at the end. I'll pass on to the Deputy Chair. Thank you very much, <clears throat> and um, it's good to meet you all. Uh, look, I think we've, you've touched a fair bit on recent challenges, decision-making, and, and, and some of the communications uh, that we've, we've been through. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to follow another line, uh, Governor, from your opening statement about uh, the role that fiscal policy uh, can play working with monetary policy. Um, you talked about those two working well together. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of an open question, yeah. but I invite your comment on it. What, what might that look like, given the, uh, the sort of outlook that you've presented uh, for us today? Yeah. Thank you. Well, during the crisis, um, or during the pandemic, the, the Reserve Bank and the government worked very well together. There was very strong coordination between fiscal and monetary policy. I had many meetings with the government and it was a good process of consultation and shared um, knowledge. Um, so that was a, that was a in, in, from where I sit, that was a, um, a very constructive process and the country benefited from it. Uh, outside crisis periods, there's kind of less explicit coordination of monetary and fiscal policy and I understand why that's the case. Um, 
At the moment, I don't have any particular concerns about the setting of, monetary, uh, of fiscal policy. Uh, we've got a budget coming up in, a, in a, a month's time, so I'll be looking at that very carefully. My main observation on fiscal policy is really a medium-term one. Uh, there is a significant issue there. Um, at the moment, we, the closest to full employment we've been in 50 years, and we've got the highest terms of trade ever in Australian history. Yet we've still got a budget deficit and projected to have a budget deficit. So that's a significant issue. The community wants the government to provide a whole range of services, understandably. We want um, really high quality aged care, great education, world-class disability care, uh, you know, fantastic national defence, great infrastructure. So the community wants all these things from our governments. It's understandable. What we haven't worked out as a community is how to pay for it. And this is why we have kind of got these budget deficits despite full employment and the record terms of trade. We've got, to, at least in principle, there are three ways that you can pay for it. Uh, you can raise more taxes to pay for the things the community want. You can cut back in other areas. Both of these things are very difficult. Aren't they? No one wants to pay more taxes and no one wants cutbacks in other areas. Or we can get the economy to grow more strongly so the pie is bigger. And that requires hard choices on a whole bunch of structural reform issues. Each of those are very difficult, aren't they? Taxes, cutting back and structural reform. We have to do the, one of those th three things, maybe all three of them, if we're going to pay for the goods and services that the community wants from our governments. So that's my medium term fiscal issue. It's not really bearing on the current setting of monetary policy. I have no, no issues there, but I do worry how as a community and a society are we going to tackle this need to pay for the things that we want as a community, the government to deliver for us. The best uh, option here is to do structural reform, to have a bigger pie. So there are more resources to pay for aged care, <coughs> disability care, great education and defence. But that requires both governments and businesses to do things that are difficult. Sorry, that's the end of my <laughs> no, comments on fiscal policy. But, but at the moment I have no particular concerns and we're waiting for the budget uh, next month. Would there be, uh, and, and forgive me for teasing further, but would there be things you'd be looking for that would potentially uh, put at risk the successful? deployment of the monetary policy that you're looking for? Um, well, you, you're, you've, you've raised yeah. those three areas yep. that you'd, you'd expect us to be working into. If, if we weren't addressing those areas, would that potentially prolong the period by which we'd have to deploy uh, higher rates? Well, we're talking really hypotheticals here. There's clearly a kind of a setting of fiscal policy uh, that would put more pressure on us to push up interest rates if we had kind of a, another significant fiscal expansion at a time when the economy is doing well and people can't, uh, businesses can't find workers, then that would have put upward pressure on interest mm. rates. But that's not my expectation and uh, it'll be in the budget, um, but we, we'll wait and see. I, my focus really here, not as just the central bank governor, but as an Australian, is how we pay for these things. Because mm. we can't pay for these things on the national credit card, we shouldn't be. There are better ways of doing it. And whether this budget's the time to start that process or um, there'll be another budget in May, I understand. But uh, I would hope during this term of parliament that you could start addressing uh, probably each of those three things to pay for the services that our community want. So I, I guess a, a, a tightening of, of settings would be expected from your side? A Tightening. I, I, I don't really have particular kind of expectations about what will be in the the, um, the budget. I think, as we all know, the community is suffering um, cost of living pressures, and um, uh, there's pressure <coughs> on the government to um, aid people with that. That's understandable. Uh, how far the government goes in that direction, I'm, I, I don't know. Uh, but I'm not. I'm not concerned that there's going to be some change in fiscal policy in the near term is going to make our job more difficult. Can I, just addressing the, the issues paper, one thing I'm interested in is, is I guess, the, the theme of, of holding board members accountable to their individual votes. Yep, yep. Um, 
in, in, in general terms, is, is there, what would be your view on the impact of that? Does it, are there you know, positives and negatives to it? Is, is, what else can we see through just, just that headline? Yeah, well, there are positives and negatives, and um, in many countries, the board members or the people making decisions about interest rates, their individual um, votes are recorded. Our board is unusual in the fact that it comprises largely outside people. Michelle and I are both mm -hmm. board members, but the other seven board members do not sit inside the central bank. Mm -hmm. In most other countries, the people taking decisions about interest rates live in the central bank or spend most of their time in the central bank and, um, and they're expected to be individually accountable for their votes. I think the structure of our board has led us to um, a different situation where the, the board members, some of them don't spend their life in the central bank. I think that's good that they don't, because mm -hmm. uh, I think that brings a diversity to kind of the decision-making process that you don't get if everyone making the decision lives inside mm -hmm. the central bank. But uh, the board has decided that um, it doesn't want to record individual votes and that uh, myself as the governor and the spokesman for, on monetary policy uh, historically, that was partly because there was a sense that the board members, if they had individual votes recorded, would be subject to kind of more lobbying and kind of, um, you know, if they if they represented or were seen to represent certain classes in the community, there'd be lobbying, and they were they weren't. This is very clear. They do not see themselves as representing certain segments of the society. They're there to represent the 26 million people who live here. And they, they, the judgment has been to date that by not recording individual votes, it's easier to take the perspective of the 26 million people rather than being associated with some particular group. None of that is to say that a regime in which individual votes are recorded wouldn't work. It works in some countries and um, if my board decided that's what they wanted to do, I'd be perfectly relaxed with that. So there are pluses and minors here and there's not one system that's better than another really. Um, just on, I guess, confidence and communications, and I note your, your search for nuance in communications, and I wish you good luck in that. Um, I think everyone here would Thank like you. to find that magic elixir. But um, with regard to you know, where interest rates have been in recent times, and, these, uh, and we're seeing, seeing the rate rises now, what's a reasonable view? Will, will, we, will they be returning to, to these, these sort of periods? Should people have that expectation? Um, it, it seems there's a, there's a strong you know, push back against uh, interest rates rising, but um, realistically, they, where are they rising to? Is this a more of a normalised um, setting? Can we expect them? Should people be expecting them to be um, returning lower? Um, well, I hope they don't return lower, uh, because that would mean the economy's weak. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question, but it's, it's a difficult one. But I think what I can say is the, the midpoint of our inflation target at the moment is 2.5%. So if inflation averages over the next 10 years 2.5%, mm -hmm. uh, you would expect that the, the cash rate at average is at least 2.5% as well. If it didn't, then on average you'd have a negative real rate and the risk-free rate wouldn't be compensating people for inflation. That would only happen if productivity growth was weak and the economy was weak. So the interest rate should at least average the, the midpoint of the inflation target. I suspect it should average higher than that because if there's productivity growth in the economy, that should lead to a higher real interest rate. Uh, if we can generate 1% labour productivity growth, which I hope we can, then you would expect the average interest rates over long periods of time to be equal to the inflation rate plus the rate of growth of productivity. So that would be kind of averaging an interest rate of 3% possible. And we would see movements around that with the economic cycle. And we would only see rates come back down to close to zero if we had a sharp downturn again. But I think we'll cycle around some number between two and a half and three and a half, it's hard to be specific. And we'll cycle up and down that with the um, economic cycle. So and we're closer now to that, aren't we? We're 2.35, so we're kind of getting to kind of that range that you'd think is normal, but probably still on the low side. And maybe this is a follow-on, but your, your comments in your opening, uh, your opening address there around the 2020, a, a dire outlook. 
um, ahead? How would you describe our outlook now? Uh, I, would, I would say un uncertain, but still positive. We're expecting growth in the economy to be reasonably good next year. Some a modest lift in the unemployment rate, but if we keep perspective, uh, for the past 50 years, if we'd had an unemployment rate of 4%, people would say fantastic. Underemployment is low, people are getting jobs, they're getting the hours, female labour force participation is at a record high. Uh, the youth unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in many, many decades. So even if the unemployment rate comes up to 4% from 3.5%, those things will all still be true. So that's, we've got to remember that. Uh, the Australian economy for the last 30 or 40 years has done remarkably well, but I've always thought that one black spot in our economy was that people couldn't get the jobs and the hours that they wanted. We'd struggle to get to full employment. And we're as close to full employment now than we've been in 50 years. So that's, that's fantastic news for people because getting a job and getting an education are the two kind of critical steps on the ladder of success for most people. And most people yeah. in the country can get a job today and the number of job vacancies is very high. So I think over the next little while, we're expecting the unemployment rate to come down further and then gradually uh, lift it. So the kind of the outlook for the labour market is strong and it's as strong as it's been in decades. So that's, that's, that's really good news. The uncertainties really are largely become from the global economy, which we've talked about those. And the other thing that I had been um, concerned about was the possibility of the inflation psychology shifting. Mm -hmm. That um, this period of higher inflation we're having, when inflation is going to go to 7% plus later in the year, <clears throat> that the, uh, the view would take hold that um, wages need to be fully compensated for that. If that were to happen, as I said, we'll have a very difficult time. I don't think it's going to happen. And at the moment, wages are not driving inflation and the aggregate growth of wages is consistent with inflation returning to target. But um, whether that stays the case is an uncertainty because the labour market's really tight, isn't it? And firms are finding it hard to get workers and wage growth is picking up as a result of that. So we, I know it's a difficult message, but if wage growth picks up to compensate people for full inflation, we'll have a lot of trouble. I'm hopeful that we don't. In the US and the UK, wage growth is picking up to compensate people for inflation, and that's one reason they're going to have trouble. I hope we can avoid that. So. And one last one. Um, I guess it, it just to focus on business, um, if I talk in, and I know it's only anecdotal, but, but amongst yep. the big businesses in my community, you talk about wage growth, uh, they'll say, no, no, talk about uh, payroll. Uh, their total labour costs have increased 10, 15, 20 per cent in some cases, depending on the industry, particularly the construction industry has, has, has gone through the roof. Um, uh, and at a, at a, you know, a, a tangible level for them, whether it's wages or, 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 or money going out otherwise, it's still an increased cost that they've felt. <coughs> so I guess coupling that thought with uh, the, your comment around uh, you know, businesses needing to, do, to make some difficult decisions, and um, I think it was and forgive me, I'm not, I'm not yep. throwing your words back at you, but yeah, I'm asking you to, to expand on it, uh, not seeking to increase their profit margins um, during this period. Is that a realistic expectation um, on, on business? Um, and, and given those, those increased costs that they are already feeling, although be it not yep. through wages, but through payroll. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, inflation can come from, in very broad terms, can come from three sources. It can come from higher input costs, and we've seen that with kind of um, higher um, electricity prices and raw material costs. So that's, it can come from higher input costs, and it can come from higher wages, and it can also come from higher margins. Uh, to date, it's um, largely from um, higher input costs. Uh, some pick up in wages, but that's not driving inflation. And I think in some industries, there has been an increase in margins. In a way, it's not surprising when the demand for goods has been so strong over recent years that firms don't discount as much. You know, when, when, the, uh, when the supermarkets were kind of having to close because people mm -hmm. couldn't get the, you know, so much demand, and you know, you're not going to discount. So discounting, I think, in retailing has diminished, and discounting in a number of industries has diminished as you know, many firms say to me, they want more workers, they don't want more customers at the moment. And when that's your mindset, mm -hmm you're going to push your margins up, aren't you? It would be yeah. kind of be strange if you didn't. Uh, 
So that process can't, shouldn't go too far. I don't think it has at the moment, but it's just a kind of sounding warning, but we've got to be careful there because inflation just won't, doesn't come from wages, it can come from profit margins as well. And um, part of the slowing in the economy that we'll, we're expecting um, and the rise in unemployment will probably put a bit of pressure on profit margins in some sectors as demand slows. So I'm not saying there's kind of gouging at the moment, but you know we've got to make sure that um, super high profit margins don't become a source of inflation. I don't think so, but I think it's going to happen, but it's possible. Are you relying upon uh, a change in that? In your um, I'm well, I think for inflation to come down and to kind of navigate this narrow path, I'm, we're relying on um, wage growth not picking up too much more, which is a difficult message, and relying on profit margins not rising further, in fact, coming back a little bit in some industries as demand stabilises. So we're relying on both those things. Mm. And um, that's really why I'm calling them out in my introductory statement, because they're the two things we need. We need to see those two things. I know it's not a, a comfortable message for people that uh, we're going to have a decline in real wages this year. It's tough. You know, when interest rates are rising and real wages are declining, it's pretty tough, isn't it? Uh, but next year, if our forecasts come to pass, inflation will be a bit above four. And the broadest measure of growth in wages, which is from the national accounts, average earnings per hour worked, will be close to five. So next year we're expecting real wages to be positive and the following year to be pos more, even more positive. So this year it's negative. Our wage growth is much less than the inflation rate and that's really tough for people. Mm. But if we, if we hold together on these two things we've just been talking about, growth in aggregate wages and profit margins, then next year, we can look forward to growth in real wages again. The alternative is for people to get full compensation for inflation this year in terms of what, what do you think inflation will be next year? If, if inflation's seven this year, wages are seven to compensate people, what's inflation going to be next year? High. And if you need wage compensation for that again, what's it going to be the year after? High. And we will respond to that prospect with much higher interest rates and a marked downturn. So I know it's difficult, um, but I think it's having a decline in real wages this year, but it's better than the alternative. And next year, real wages can be positive again. Thank you. I'm, I may not share your confidence on that profit um, yes. reduction, but thank you very not, much. I don't know how confident I am. I'm just raising it as an issue. It's kind of made, just, sorry, just one final comment here. <laughs> Some slowing in growth in aggregate demand will put downward pressure on profit margins, won't it? Because there'll be more discounting. And so that's partly how higher interest rates work. Mm. It's not just affecting wages, it's affecting um, the amount of discounting that occurs in the business sector mm. and the profit margins. Because if as many businesses people tell me at the moment, they want more workers, they don't want more customers. Mm. So you're gonna put your prices up, aren't you? In that, it'd be crazy not to. So we've got to get recalibrated to kind of where at least some businesses again saying, I'd like some more customers and perhaps I'm going to discount to get them. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Deputy Chair. So I'll hand over now to Dr. Charlton. Thank you, Chair. You noted that interest rates have increased substantially recently, and you also said that as a result of those substantial increases, interest rates would be going higher, but potentially at a slower rate. I think your words were that we're getting closer to normal settings. Yeah. And in response to a question from the Deputy Chair, you gave a view on what those normal settings might be, nominal terms. My question to you is, when you think about those normal settings, do you think about rates in nominal terms or in real terms? Uh, we start off from thinking about the, the um, neutral real rate. And so that's in real terms. Uh, but we set a nominal rate, don't we? So we have to translate the real rate into a, um, a nominal rate. And the way we do that is um, adding on a measure of expected inflation. And I expect that over time we'll um, hit the inflation target of 2.5%. So we translate the concept of a real rate into a nominal rate by adding on 2.5%. Uh, the neutral real rate is subject to a huge amount of uncertainty and uh, Next month, I think Lucy's going to give a speech outlining all the various models we use to um, come up with our estimates. But my reading of the evidence is that it's likely that the 
neutral wheel rate is at least positive. It would be kind of pretty sad state of the world if um, the neutral wheel rate was negative. It's possible because uh, of demographics and um, other things, but it's, I think it's unlikely. So if you start from that saying that the neutral wheel rate is at least zero, add two and a half percent, it says kind of the, it's the normal level of the nominal rate is two and a half percent. As I said in response to the Deputy Chair's questions, I hope it's higher than that because I'm optimistic about productivity growth. Thank you. And uh, if, as you say, the neutral real rate is positive, um, uh, what, does that, what does that mean the real rate is today? Uh, well, it's, it's still negative because the nominal cash rate is 2.35 and, uh, uh, well, inflation this is likely to be 7 and expected inflation over the next couple of years is higher than 2.5%. Uh, but uh, long term inflation expectations are still anchored at 2.5%. So if you use a measure of longer term inflation expectations, it's only very marginally <coughs> negative. And this is one of the reasons why we think we need to go further. Uh, you know, 2.35, I think the rate is still too low. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah, you. No. You go ahead. So, so in turn, if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, that means that today the the real rate uh, is I think you said um, I think you said something like six uh, percent inflation today forecasted to rise up to seven percent, and the current uh, uh, so that that would mean we're about four hundred basis points. Am I doing the math right? Well, that's so yeah, it's the, the yeah the. You take the nominal rate minus inflation expectations. So it depends which measure of inflation expectations you want to use. If you use the expected inflation over the next year, um, well, we're expecting inflation to be 4% in 2023. So. Uh, the, my, my question is about today's real yeah, rate. Yeah, today, so, you're right. So you, you're right. You know, if you. Um, so today's real rate is like minus, minus 4%? Yeah, if you, if you 2.35 minus 7. Yeah, you're getting that'd be more minus, than, minus, that'd be more minus, than minus. Yeah, that's right. So, but I wouldn't draw the conclusion that you have to get kind of rates up to seven percent to get to a, uh, a, a neutral kind of nominal rate because um, inflation expectations over the medium term are much lower than that. So, uh, I wouldn't draw that conclusion from that math. Sure. I guess I guess my question is when you when you said uh, earlier that we're getting close to a normal setting and real rates today are something lower than minus 4%, um, that feels like quite a long way away from what you described as the neutral <coughs> real rate of something positive. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm back on this measure of inflation expectations. I'm inclined to kind of su subtract two and a half uh, from um, um, the nominal rate to get the estimate of the of the real rate, and um, we've got two two point three five minus two and a half. It's just a small negative number. So, and uh, if we have a few interest rate increases over the coming months, it'll start to get um, more positive. So, you know, you can do these kind of calculations lots of different ways, uh, but I don't think it's the right thing to do to use the current inflation rate in calculating um, the neutral, or in calculating the real interest rate. And, and, and why is that? Why would you not use the current inflation rate rather than what I think you seem to be using, which is a view of inflation expectations yeah. over some period? Yeah, because if you use the current inflation, let's say 7%, which is what will be later in the year, would say to kind of have a neutral setting of interest rates in Australia, you'd need the cash rate to be um, at least 7%. My judgment, and I think the judgment of most of my colleagues, would that would be incredibly contractionary for the economy and would um, throw us into a sharp recession. So I don't think that's the right way of thinking about what the neutral nominal rate is at the moment. Because most, if, if, if you thought that inflation was going to stay at 7%, it'd be exactly the right calculation to do. If businesses thought they were going to be able to put their prices up by 7% every year for the next five years and the interest rate was 2.3, well, 
be way too low, wouldn't it? And things would be going crazy. But at the moment, uh, most people think that inflation in a few years' time will be back to two point something. So they're not kind of looking at their borrowing decisions. If you're borrowing for over the next 10 years, you're not thinking that inflation's going to be going up at 7% every year. If you did, then interest rates have got to go up a lot. And this is why I kind of inflation expectations and inflation psychology is so important. And I, why I want to um, remind people how serious we are at getting inflation back down. Because yes. if you don't believe that, if you don't believe we're serious at getting back down and we'll do what's necessary and you believe inflation is going to be 7% for the next uh, five years, then interest rates have to go up a lot. And we don't want that. Right. So <laughs> this is a, it's a long-winded answer, but this is why I don't kind of think it's the uh, right thing to do to kind of take 7% off the current rate. Uh, you only do that if you think when you're making borrowing decisions, you're factoring a 7% increases in inflation year after year, which... Really, I hope people sure. don't do that. Sure, but, but but that is the current real. That is the current real. Well, as defined by you, yes. Yeah, you get this. <laughs> it's kind of the the nominal the nominal rate minus expected inflation. So, yep. you, as you've defined it, yes. Sure. But that don't draw the conclusion yeah. that we've got to have a a nominal rate right at seven percent to keep the economy in balance. I'm I'm, I'm not drawing that yep. that conclusion, but yep. I, but I am yep. asking you the question, yep. which is. You, your your calculation of the of the current real interest rate seems to be relating to what you um, what you to, to want a bit, for a better word hope that the interest rate will be in in uh, in so hope that the inflation rate will be in a couple of years time. Now we've had significant um, inflation uh, challenges in yep. forecasting inflation. Uh, so we don't really know what what that will be, as you say. We you know we have a view on inflation expectations, but those inflation expectations have not been a very good guide for what inflation is going to be over the recent period. What we do know is what inflation is is today. Um, you, you, know, you also said that you know in order to get down to a lower level of inflation, we'll need to have demand slowing. So how how do you reconcile a current uh, real rate that is something lower than minus four uh, percent, with the slowing of demand in order to achieve the inflation rate that you uh, are putting into your model for the medium term real uh, inflation rate. Uh, there are a few points. It's, it's more than a hope that um, inflation is going to come down. I certainly hope Good. it's going to come down, but. Uh, most measures of inflation expectations derived from financial markets, people who are kind of making their livings kind of by betting what inflation expectations are going to be, what inflation is going to be, uh, are predicting that within a few years inflation will be back with a two in front of it. So that's um, the, the collective judgment of people making um, investment decisions. So, but we've all been wrong before, so we could be all wrong again. And if we are wrong, and inflation does stay high, then we're going to face much higher interest rates. Uh, so let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, why is inflation going to come down when the, um, the real rate is minus four on your calculation? So it's a, it's a, good, um, it's a good question. Uh, there are a number of factors. First is that most people you know, don't think inflation is going to stay at 7%. So they're not factoring that into the decision-making process. They're factoring in uh, increases of 2 or 3%. Uh, but um, I think probably more fundamentally, what we're seeing in global markets at the moment is an increase in supply and a reduction in demand for goods. In the United States, is in one single year during the pandemic, total demand for goods rose by 20%. Just in one year, the demand for goods rose by 20%. And that was just at the time that the global supply chains were impaired. So even if they hadn't been impaired, the system couldn't have coped with that. People couldn't travel, they couldn't go to restaurants, they had to the theatre or the football or whatever. And so they sat at home and they bought goods for the house. So that put huge pressure on uh, global supply chains and in response to kind of the discussion we are having before, kind of firms put up their prices, wouldn't, why wouldn't you if demand was going so quickly? And uh, so that added to the inflation impulse a lot in the global economy. Shipping times 
blew out, shipping costs blew out, and that's all now in the process of reversing. Demand for goods in the US really hasn't grown for six months. Shipping costs are coming right back down. Waiting times for delivery of uh, inputs are coming right back down. So that's taking inflation pressures out of the system. Another thing that's um, helping is that commodity prices are coming off again. As the um, outlook for the global economy is deteriorated, commodity prices have come down. And the big increase in commodity prices we saw after Russia invaded Ukraine has been reversed. There was a huge amount of um, media coverage of the big increase in wheat prices. Well, that's all been reversed now. There's kind of been good harvest in Australia and North America, I think. And some of the panicking that took place after the war started uh, has re reversed. So commodity prices are coming back down. The global balance between good, uh, demand and supply for goods is fixing up. Uh, so those, those things are going to bring inflation back down. Remember, inflation is the rate of change of prices. So even if prices stayed at the higher level, you know, the rate of inflation goes to zero for you know, those goods. So, and if prices actually come down, we get negative contributions. We see this kind of in um, the price of petrol at the Bowser. Last year, it went up 32% in Australia. That added, I think, a percent and a bit to the CPI. I don't think it's going to, let's hope it doesn't go up another 32%. I think it's probably going to come down. The cost of building a new home went up 20%. Probably not another 20% this year. So there's, there are kind of things going on in the supply demand balance in particular industries that give us hope that inflation will come down. And as long as profit margins don't rise too much and as long as wages don't rise too much, inflation will come back down. Right. That's out my centre of view, and I think that's eminently plausible and credible. But we've made big errors before, and no doubt we'll make them again. But at the moment, uh, the, the view amongst the central banks and the paid forecasters and the, the financial markets is inflation will come back down again, partly for the reason I just talked about. Thank you. Um, I, I guess my last question, Governor, is in a period of at least currently very loose financial conditions with real rates at you know, somewhere below minus 4%. In the answer you just gave, you said that your view that the real rate should be thought of differently based on your expectation that inflation will be coming down. And then you said the two main factors for why inflation will be coming down will be supply side factors and uh, commodity price, uh, commodity price uh, factors. With both of those things, I think you and the deputy governor said in earlier uh, questions were two of the hardest things to forecast. Uh, two of the things in which we have uh, had the largest uh, forecast errors. Um, in that case, does it give you some concern that uh, your view of what the real rate might hope to be, or <laughs> to use other language, expect yeah, to be, yeah. uh, it has a lot of uncertainty around it? And in fact, our current level of real real interest rates is a long way from what you think is neutral. Yeah. I mean, there, you're right, there is a lot of uncertainty. The, um, you pointed to the two parts of the answer. I could have um, extended my answer and about why inflation is going to come down. The higher interest rates are crimping spending in the economy and the, you know, the effect of that is going to build. So in our domestic economy, we're going to get a better balance between the demand and supply. And we talked earlier in the hearing about the uncertainty in the global economy. So there's quite a lot of um, negativity about the global economy. Just this last weekend, I was in Basel in Switzerland with the central bank governors and there's, for the reasons we talked about before, there's quite a lot of concern about the global economy. So the supply side's fixing up, commodity prices have come down, we're raising interest rates and the global economy is looking a bit fragile. So those things will, I hope and expect, uh, bring inflation down. If all that's wrong and inflation stays high, then interest rates are going to have to be higher. If, um, if really for the calculations you were just saying, if inflation turns out to be 6% six, six or 7% again next year, interest rates are going to have to be much higher. I don't expect that to happen, but you know, unexpected things do happen, don't they? Thank you very uh, much, yeah. Governor. I'll yeah. hand back to the chair. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Charlton. Um, so I now suspend hearings uh, for a short break. Uh, we'll resume at uh, 11 a.m. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I now resume the hearings and, and hand over to Ms. Spender. Thank you Thanks. very much.
Um, thank you for you know your comments to date. I you raised I think a really interesting I think challenge that we face right now in the sense that we have as you say full employment record terms of trade and a structural deficit, and the the opportunities that we we have in terms of how we have to address that over longer term. Um, I'm really interested in your thoughts on some of those key structural reforms um, that you think we should be considering in this space um, to drive productivity. Uh, it's a good question. It's not really kind of my <coughs> core of competence, but I note that um, the Productivity Commission now is doing their five yearly review. The last one they did was shifting, called Shifting the Dial, and mm -hmm. I think it was back in 2017, and it had a lot of very good suggestions about the way we design our cities, the way that um, public services are provided by the government. So that report had a lot of good mm. ideas. Not all have been implemented. Uh, but the list of areas where reform is needed, I think, is, is long. And um, I'm just really, I've got a few notes here, but I'm just, these are points that others have made, that taxation system, mm. the combination of taxes on land, income, consumption, natural resources and savings. I'd, anyone who looks at that doesn't say we've got the optimal system. In fact, they say we're a long way from optimal on, on most of those areas. So that's a, an issue for the parliament that's very difficult. Uh, the way we select and price infrastructure, there are improvement opportunities there. Uh, the way we train our workers, our, our um, people who work in Australia, the accumulation of human capitals starting at um, preschool and then going right through to university. Um, the way we regulate the energy system, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we probably haven't nailed that. Uh, the complexity of the regulatory system and the rewards we establish for innovation. The way we train our people to use data and protect data and to take advantage of data. So these are all areas where Australia has huge opportunities. I think if we put our collective wheels, our shoulders to the wheel, then we can do this. But it requires both reform from government and businesses. It's not just government to do it. As businesses have to step up in each of these areas as well. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of reports that um, uh, give us good suggestions. Yeah said to kind of committees previously, mm -hmm. the issue isn't knowing what to do, it's actually developing the political and other capability to do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Professor Warwick and McKibben has argued that climate change impacts are likely to lead to a more frequent and more severe negative supply shocks. And you know, is that your view? And slightly more broadly, how is the RBA considering how it addresses climate change from a monetary um, policy point of view? Thank you. Well, I agree with um, Professor McKibben's observation that we are going to see more supply shocks because of climate, and we'll have to factor that into our decision making. We're spending a lot of time on climate related issues, uh, not just because they affect the, the economy, but also the financial system. Mm -hmm. uh, the energy transition is a huge opportunity for Australia and could reshape our exports. Mm -hmm. Coal exports over time will go to zero and gas will, um, over time, will, will be depleted as well. But we have huge opportunities there. So in thinking about the, the prospects of the country over the next 20 or 30 years, the investments we make in renewable energy are incredibly important. Mm. They don't affect kind of monetary policy decisions from month to month, but over the next 20 years, they're going to be incredibly important. They're affecting the investment outlook, where the jobs will be, and the prices we pay for a whole bunch of uh, goods and services. So. Mm. It, they're really important framing issues for our decisions, but obviously they're not going to affect whether we change interest rates by 25 or 50 basis points next month, but they're really important framing issues. Uh, the other set of issues that we're working very closely on are related to the financial sector, and I chair the Council of Financial Regulators. There are two major pieces of work going on there. The first is the climate risk vulnerability assessment. So, asking the banks to do these exercises mm -hmm. to see how well they're prepared and managing climate risks. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, which is uh, work that really ASIC is leading, is disclosure. Mm -hmm. Because the allocation of capital is critically important to solving many of these risks and for the capital markets to work well, people need information. They need to understand what your risks are, how you manage them and what the opportunities are. And 
there's a global effort here to improve the quality and comprehensiveness and consistency of disclosure. Mm -hmm. ASIC is leading that work and through the Council of Financial Regulators, uh, we're spending a lot of time and I think that's really important because capital markets will help us seize the opportunities we have as a country here, but we need the capital markets to have the information to make the right decisions. So it's not just governments kind of putting in place the right policy framework, it's the, the disclosure environment uh, guiding the allocation of capital. Uh, we're also involved with a, a group called the Network for the Greening of the Financial System, which is where the central banks around the world have come together mm -hmm. to look at um, these issues in a global context. So we're mm -hmm. spending quite a lot of time with that group as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to get to another very difficult issue, which is housing um, yep. and housing and housing affordability. Um, you know, we, you know, obviously one of the biggest impacts of the increasing in interest rates is is falling on households when housing affordability by global measures is extremely low in this country. Anyway, um, you know, I'm interested in your perspective on how important housing, increasing housing supply in the long term is 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 important to um, supporting greater financial stability affordability in the economy as well as enabling households to weather better weather changing monetary policy yeah but it's a, it's a good point and um, we've discussed this at kind of previous versions of this committee because our interest rates uh, get the blame for movements in um, housing prices and i understand that mm. the decisions that we take drive a lot of the cycle in, in housing prices. So that's um, why housing prices are falling now because we're raising interest rates. So a lot of the cyclical variation comes from, from the Reserve Bank. But the fact that Australians uh, have to pay high prices for housing isn't anything to do with the Reserve Bank mm -hmm. over a long period of time. It's the choices that we've made as a society have given us high housing prices. Because high housing prices come not from the high cost of construction, yeah. they come from the high cost of land embedded in each of our dwellings. Mm. So why do we have a high cost of land embedded in our dwellings? It's because the choices we've made. The choices we've made about taxation, the choices we've made about um, zoning yeah. and urban design, uh, the fact that most of us have chosen to live in fantastic cities on the coast. Mm. Uh, the fact that um, when we choose to live in these fantastic cities on the coast, we want a block of land. We don't want to live in kind of high density. And we've chosen a society to underinvest in transport. Mm. So all those things have either increased the supply, uh, sorry, reduced the supply of well-located land or increase the demand for well-located land. So we have high land prices embedded, uh, mm. which give us high housing prices. And interest rates influence the cycle, but not structurally. We see mm. kind of in country, you know, the US is a good example. Parts of the US, interest rates have been lower than they were here, but housing prices are much lower. Mm. Because as a society, they've made different choices about where they live, the investment in transport, mm. and the taxation. So. You know, it's the choices we've made as a people that have given us high housing prices, mm -hmm. even though the interest rates um, influence the cycle. But mm -hmm. and we can't, the central bank can't do anything about that. I, as an individual, but there's not as a central bank government, I think it would be better if we make different choices mm -hmm. to give a um, lower average level of housing prices that would give people more opportunity and um, uh, uh, need, people would need to borrow less. Mm -hmm. I think the other choice we've made of society is to make mortgage finance freely available. Mm. You know, great, you know, dynamic, competitive financial sector is happy to provide mortgage finance. So everything we've done is, if you ask what choices society could make to give high housing prices, we've made them all. We've made them all. <laughs> okay. Not to say good or bad, but that's what we've done. Yeah. Okay. Um, your, you know, one of the RBA's mandates is to um, deliver full employment. Um, the you know, with the current rate of unemployment, I think this perspective on what is actually the non-accelerate and Nairu yeah. effectively is um, is a really interest is a sort of much more debated than I think in the past. I'd love to understand from your point of view, you know, how are you starting to think about Nairu, uh, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, yeah. Yeah. and how do um, and how do you start to evaluate your your future models in relation to that now? Yeah, it's a 
it's a good question. It's a it's a hard one as well. Not so long ago, people were saying, well, if we get the unemployment rate in Australia down to five, that would be yep. a great outcome. And I, I had been hopeful that we could do better than that, and I was hopeful we could get it down to four. I thought, gee, if we could get the unemployment yep. rate to four, that would be a fantastic outcome. Mm. Here we are at three and a half. I'm doubtful that whether we can sustain three and a half because the uh, the feedback we're getting from business through the liaison program at three and a half percent unemployment is just way, way too hard to get find workers. Mm. But you never know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Lucy, has your staff been doing kind of yes. modelling and yes, you know? We have. Said, um, I mean, I think one of the challenges, uh, you know, the governor's absolutely right. We've been thinking something in. Uh, in the you know low fours, I, mm -hmm. I think I said in part at the last uh, meeting of um, the previous version of this committee, you know something in the high threes to low fours was our current best assessment, and, mm -hmm. and we used something at the upper end of that range as the sort of the notional Nairu in our most recent round of forecasts. Um, unfortunately, you know the standard academic models of how to you know estimate the Nairu because you do have to infer it from data. You can't. Mm -hmm. Just it's 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 not there, you know, to be seen directly. Um, because they unfortunately those models they look at the pandemic period and they tell you that the Nairu was going up mm -hmm. at the moment. Now I don't believe that for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not think that the actual evidence on wages growth tells you that the Nairu is you know back above five. Mm -hmm. But you know these models they look at inflation and wages growth and unemployment altogether. And you know, so there's also an assumption. You know, you also have to infer inflation expectations from the various, uh, you know, partial indicators of that. And that, you know, those standard models are very much on the the assumption that everything's driven by demand. They mm -hmm. don't deal with supply shocks, and they've certainly never seen a lockdown before. And so those models would spit out a much higher number. So mm -hmm. one of the active pieces of um, work that the team are working on is, you know, how do you actually sort of manage uh, a, a Nauru estimate when there's been a, a pandemic and you've had these big supply shocks. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I mean, we have had to just a, apply some better judgment, uh, you know, in, in the most recent re forecast rounds, but I think it's, it's an active area of research. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and, and then I've, I'll come to my final question. I think I'm almost out of time, but it's just more about the lags. Um, you know, you're, you've, you mentioned in your opening remarks that one of the issues yeah. that we face is the lags to, you know, the impact of, of, your, um, of the rate rises, particularly in relation to people who have fixed rates mortgages. How, you, um, how do you account for the potential lags in, in feeling these, these changes? And what are some of the lessons we can learn from the past in terms of how those lags have, have played out that, that we should bear right now? Yeah, but the evidence that we have from the past is that when we change interest rates, it's the maximum effect on economic activity is roughly 18 months to two years yeah. afterwards, and then it takes a while for that to feed through to inflation. So there's a kind of maybe a two-year lag before we see the maximum effect of that, and that's understandable because the, when you think about the transmission mechanisms of monetary policy, one's the exchange rate, mm -hmm. so the exchange rate changes, and then it takes time for firms to change their investment and um, sourcing decisions, and then. Uh, Another is through changes in housing price, we've talked about before, and that affects spending, but it takes time for people mm. to do that. And then once people change their spending, then it takes time for firms to adjust their investment plans. So by the time you go through all these um, layers, they're quite long effects. And we're very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to um, forecast, this is one of the reasons we have to forecast. Mm. Uh, during the... Um, early stages of the pandemic, we said we were going to base our monetary policy on actual inflation. Because we'd had a period where we were undershooting the inflation target and mm. it was, you know, our forecasts had not been that good and we had to focus very much on actual outcomes. Now that actual outcomes have moved so much, we're moving <laughs> back into a world where we've got to rely more on our forecasts. Mm -hmm. And in forecasting, we factor in these um, 18 months to two year lags. Uh, the other th um, consideration in kind of setting policy is not just thinking, understanding the lags, but the, think about the level of interest rates. And really, in response to Andrew's questions before about is the level of interest rates roughly expansionary or, or mm. um, contractionary or neutral? And so, put together the assessment there level, it's getting close to normal, probably still a bit low, mm -hmm. and the lags. Mm -hmm. 
So it's it's difficult because the lags changes through time as well. Mm. We know that the fact that households have built up all these buffers, some people argue, allows households to smooth through interest rate increases in a way that they mightn't have done in the past. Mm. Is in the last two years, in aggregate, households saved an extra two hundred and fifty billion dollars over and above what they would have normally mm. done in a two-year period. Two hundred and fifty billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Mm. It's not evenly distributed. So well, that's another thing we're kind of factoring in, kind of the lags that how are people going to use that extra $250 billion? Are they just going to let it sit there and be part of their accumulated wealth? Mm. Or are they going to drag, uh, draw down these buffers? So this is why there's so much uncertainty at yep. the moment, because there's a lot of moving pieces and it's pretty tough. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. very much. Um, I'll hand over now to Ms Lawrence. Thank you. Um, I've heard very clearly um, that you have the will uh, to, you know, and the resolve to restore price stability. Do you feel you have the tools to do so? Uh, I do think we have. We, um, we do have the tools, and int interest rates are a blunt tool, but they're a powerful one. Thank you. And um, I hope we don't have to use it uh, too much. But um, we do. I think we do have the tool to, to get inflation back down again, and we we will use that tool to the extent we need to. Thank you. And so I guess leading a little further on. Uh, from the questions that Ms Spender did ask you around that cumulative impact of the interest rate rises that you've just now done already. Um, have, you know, what sort of analysis are you doing in, in case there is a, a more severe response from consumers than expected? You know, a, a more severe response, you mean that people cut back spending um, a lot, then if that were to happen, then the profile of interest rates is obviously lower, because one of the kind of the critical um, factors driving the economy is consumer spending. And at the moment, the card data, the payments data we have, and the retail data in our liaison all suggest that people are continuing to spend. Uh, many people are kind of downgrading, they're kind of the, maybe the, going for a cheaper cut of meat or something, but they're still spending. Mm. Uh, if it turns out that the um, the big decline in consumer sentiment ends up weighing on spending by more than we think, then that will have implications for the path of interest rates. So is but that the main indicator that you're using to track consumer impact is around their credit card usage, uh, the discretionary of, and non-discretionary you know, We've got spending. a whole, you know, as Lucy talked about before, we've, um, one of the benefits of the improvements in kind of data and kind of collection is that we've got access to a lot more data on card spending, um, uh, you know, retail sales. We talk to the the, uh, the, the uh, retailers all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we track mobility at shopping centres. Or, or we've got a whole bunch sure. of things that we can uh, now look at that in previous years we wouldn't have been able to do. So I feel like we've got a better read now on what's going on right mm -hmm. at any given point in time than we used to. But so how then, when we consider back in February, you talk yep. about, talked about the need to be patient. Yep. Um, but now we've seen five successive rate rises. You've talked quite assertively that there will be further ones. Um, how are you allowing time, though, to assess that cumulative impact? Yeah, in February, we just, on underlying inflation, we just got to the midpoint of the inflation band for the first time in seven years. We'd had underlying inflation below the midpoint of the target band for seven years. So in February, um, inflation was still pretty low. Um, a lot, as I said in the introductory remarks, a lot has changed since then, has it? And um, the inflation dynamics have moved a lot. And they see, some of them seem pretty persistent. Uh, others will fall away. And so we're just having to factor in the things that will fall away. Um, the lower commodity prices and the improvements in um, the global supply chains will help, but... Um, so you, sp you spoke about, and in fact, um, I think Lucia did too, about having, applying extreme vigour in your, you know, your analysis, um, accepting that consumer confidence is weak, but they're still spending, yep. but how long this will last for, you don't know. Yep. And yet, in the next breath, you talk about you will increase rates. You, the question is, by how much? Yep. So why isn't taking no action a consideration until you have had time to assess the impact of the lags of the five rate rises you've imposed already? Yep. I mean, we've been talking about the consumer side. 
on the business side, business confidence is above average. When you ask businesses how things at the moment, they're saying very, very good, and they're hiring people at record rates. So it's not, it's not a, just a tale of negativity on the consumer side. It's the business side of the economy. Businesses are saying, at least in aggregate, things are very good. In fact, mm -hmm. many of them are saying that it's too hot because we can't get the workers. It's an unusual situation where business people tell us we don't really want more customers at the moment. But in a global so, context where everybody is taking the same action of yep. raising rates, is taking no action not a strategy in itself? Well, and if it's it is, a, have you given consideration yeah, to we that? We have, but it's a, it's a risk management exercise, isn't it? Because if we took no action and say interest rates didn't go any further or we hadn't moved last month, there would be a high probability that um, the community would think that we're not serious about getting inflation under control, that um, inflation expectations would adjust, that people think, well, the Reserve Bank isn't really serious about this, so I better factor in higher inflation into my um, in ongoing decision But what decision about all the and... other factors that the, that the households are looking at, such as the subsidy coming off the fuel price at the end yeah. of the month, for yeah. example? Obviously, that'll have a throw, flow through impact. The high level of household debt ratio yeah. that um, people are experiencing. My seat of Hasluck, for example, I have 55% of mortgage holders, yeah. young families yeah. starting out, um, you know, and 18% renters, so 70% yeah. of my electorate uh, you know, will, are directly impacted by the actions that the RBA take. Yeah. But in the context of direct action that's happening elsewhere in the economy, um, so if, I appreciate you talking about, you know, a lot of mortgage holders have buffers and so on, but there's, I think the CBA is suggesting 36% actually don't. Yeah. And that if you do enact further rate rises between now and Christmas, um, I think the numbers are quite extraordinary that some 40%, it could be an increase of 40% on repayments for some for yeah. some third of mortgage holders, which is an awful lot in yeah. my electorate, by of their repayments, so an increase of 40% on their repayments by the end of the year. So in, in that climate, where they're already quite pinched, yeah. um, but there are other levers being pulled, perhaps in the fiscal um, policy. How how is it that you can't consider uh, waiting and being patient as you were in February this time around, and to see the impact of those five um, rate rises? Yeah, the, the main difference with February is um, inflation. In February, but underlying... are you not seeing though, like with the, like just take the petrol yep. price subsidy yep. being removed in September? What will be the impact of that? Like I think it will potentially raise you know the price of goods and whatnot, which will potentially have the same yep. impact of yep. dampening consumer demand. Mm -hmm. If you take no in, impact, no action, what impact will that have on the currency? Potentially making imports more expensive might have a dampening effect again on consumer demand. So if if that's the outcome you're looking for. Is there not other ways to achieve that, given you've already taken five well, steps to We don't date? have any other tools. To do. I mean, but I know you do, it's... but to do nothing is also, <laughs> is also well, a tool. But it just, it's, it's a risk management exercise, because um, if we were to do nothing and inflation expectations were to adjust higher and uh, inflation were to persist at the higher rates, then that's going to be very bad for the people in your electorate. Because it is already bad. Well, it is. <laughs> so it's a trade-off. It will <laughs> likely get worse by Christmas. It, 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 um, it will get more difficult, but it will be more difficult still if inflation gets entrenched higher, then we will have to have much, much higher interest rates to get it back down because we can't um, have a world where inflation just stays high. Because but we this know isn't... That, but this... It, you seem yeah. to sometimes yep. come back to looking at things in a vacuum as, con as without looking at all the other factors that are at play. You've spoken about the supply chain yep. um, easing, the disruptions they're easing, which will hopefully lower prices. Um, we, we've talked about, um, you know, the government's got different policies, you know, be it around improving yep. housing stocks and, and supply. You've talked about housing prices yep. coming down. So all these other factors, commodity prices are lowering. Um, so you've talked about all these other factors, but then you still seem to come back. And I, it's not to say you're wrong. Yep. I'm just asking, I don't understand the logic of yet of why you're quite adamant that it, there has to be a rate rise as opposed to considering the cumulative impact of the rate rises haven't yet landed um, and we know the household debt ratio is 
at its highest. Yeah. So how, how are we layering all of these different elements to still arrive at that it, we must raise rate rises? Why isn't we may raise rate rises, not something that you're, yeah. you're speaking to instead? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, well, I mean, we've, we, we've done our best to take into account all the factors that you're talking about. We know there are lags, we know that people are hurting. Uh, we also know that um, businesses are hiring people at record rates, that uh, they want to in businesses want to invest and that there's quite a lot of um, forward momentum in, in the business sector. Uh, when we um, do our forecasts, we do our best to take all those various things into account and when we put a, a, a further increase in interest rates in the forecast, we still have inflation next year at four and a bit and it's not until 20, late 2024, so more than two years away, that inflation's back to 3%. So even with further increases in interest rates and the pain that many people are experiencing, we still think inflation is going to be above 3% in you know, two years' time. And the longer it stays above 3%, the more difficult it's going to become. Because expectations are just, we had the conversation with Andrew, and if that happens, then we have higher interest rates and a recession, which is damaging. So we've got two difficult kind of positions at the moment, a bit of kind of some pain now, and hopefully real wages start rising again next year against the risk of not doing anything, just sitting on our hands and having inflation stay higher. And well, I don't think anyone is sitting on their hands. I think there are a lot of other, and that's my point, there are other ele elements. Yep. It wouldn't be a case of sitting on your hands. I'm not yep. suggesting that that's yep. how the perception yep. or the experience would be. Um, and you talked about, you know, some uh, around wage growth. Um, I appreciate, you know, that we're a wonderful place of full employment, but we heard this week that some 900,000 people are actually having to take a second job because they're, perhaps their wages that they're receiving are just insufficient to be able to make ends meet. Mm. That's obviously going to be amplified um, by your you know, intention yeah. to increase rate rises, um, increase the interest rates. Um, so previously you've stated that you feel 3.5% wage growth is sustainable. Um, I, I just would like to see how you feel about that in the context of, of the pressure and the constraints that people are, are already mm. experiencing without yet that impact of the interest rate rises fully landing in the households yet. Yeah. I've said previously that I thought 3.5% was a reasonable anchor point for thinking about what type of wage increases uh, our economy can deliver over the medium term, and that was on the basis that expected to deliver 2.5% inflation, and labour productivity growth, let's say 1%, and workers should get uh, their share of that. So 2.5 plus 1 would give 3.5% growth in, um, in, in a broad measure of wages. I think that's that's a reasonable anchor point. If productivity growth is slower than that, then 3.5% will be too high. Mm -hmm. If productivity growth is stronger than that, as it was in the 1990s, because businesses and government instituted reform, then we can do better than that. So it really comes down to um, productivity growth. Yeah. Um, in the short run, inflation's higher, isn't it? And so, uh, so I talked about this before, that. Well, it's very difficult for people to experience declines in their real wages this year. I mean, I know it's really hard for people, particularly when interest rates are rising. So there's a natural tendency to say, well, we shouldn't allow that to happen, that wages should go up faster to compensate people for the inflation. I mean, I can understand why people think that. It's kind of at some level it makes sense, doesn't it? But if you accept that proposition and wages grow by 6% to compensate people for inflation, what do you think inflation will be next year? It'll still be high, and we'll need to say to people, we well, get compensation for that, because we don't want you to um, suffer a decline in your real wages. And then the following year, inflation's high. And that would have to be responded to with much higher interest rates. So while it's difficult, and, and it's very hard for people um, to experience a decline in real wages this year, I think the alternative, sadly, is, is much more difficult. And just one, and this is why one, kind just of, one kind of, final question, yes, if I may. Sir. Um, on a completely different yep. note, um, as you're right to do, um, on the 19th of July 2021 and again on the 27th of January 2022, you met with the then Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. 
Um, I note that uh, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, was also in attendance. Were you made aware of the fact that the RRPA had two treasurers for that period, from May last year to uh, May this year? And was this dual arrangement um, ever reported to you as the Governor? No, it was not. I was as surprised as uh, the rest of the community. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Um, next, uh, we have Mr. Van Manen. Well, th thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Lowe, and uh, the rest of the team there. Uh, apologies, I can't be joining you in person. Um, I've been listening with a great deal of interest to a variety of the questions from, from colleagues and, and your responses, Mr. Lowe. Um, Probably to follow on from uh, Tanya's recent line of, of questioning uh, around the impacts on families, uh, I suspect her electorate is very much like mine and um, these interest rate rises impact uh, my middle to lower socioeconomic uh, parts of my community at a much greater rate, both <clears> in terms of maybe directly through mortgage costs or, or through uh, rental increases. Uh, in addition to uh, increasing grocery prices, increasing electricity prices, um, increasing fuel prices, etc. Um, can you please explain to me, because I haven't heard your response in any of these questions, how increasing interest rates is going to possibly impact and reduce any of these cost of me living measures uh, which are in part reflecting in the inflation rate. Well, inflation's high for, for two reasons. One is the, the global story, and we can't really do anything, we can't do anything about that. But the other reason, I talked about this in introductory comments, is that the domestic situation. Domestic demand is very, very strong, and the economy is having trouble meeting that demand. That's the reality we face. Businesses uh, say they cannot meet the demand, many, they can't meet the demand they have. So the demand in the economy is um, very, very strong. And when demand is strong, relative to supply, prices go up. So there's no, cost. With, with the greatest respect, Mr Lowe, I, I understand the, the causes of inflation. Yep. So that, that's no mystery to me and probably to most others. Right? But is, isn't that, though, the counterpoint to the argument to raise interest rates because many of those factors are temporary, right? So we've had disaster related impacts on the cost of groceries. Uh, if you want to talk about a $10 lettuce or a $12 lettuce, um, we've had uh, global factors impacting fuel prices uh, and also energy prices. I mean, most of uh, my people here in, in Queensland certainly have had a 15% increase in their electricity prices from the 1st of July, which is yet to fully flow through. So increasing interest rates on top of that is not in the least bit going to change those factors. It's not going to reduce electricity prices. It's not going to reduce uh, the impact of, on fuel prices. Uh, it's not going to reduce the uh, cost of groceries. That will resolve itself as our farmers get back into full production following the floods. And then, in addition, you're adding interest rate increases on top of that. The, the sense in that, I don't see the sense in doubling up on those cost of living pressures for many of the people in my communities who are already struggling to make ends meet. Yeah, well, the, the higher interest rates slow growth in aggregate demand. That's true. I mean, and when there's slower growth in aggregate demand, there'll be less upward pressure on both wages and prices. Firms will have to do more discounting and inflation pressures are less. So uh, I accept that it's not going to affect the price of electricity and the price of a lettuce, but higher interest rates to the extent they affect aggregate demand. And what I'm hearing here very clearly, it is affecting aggregate demand because it, uh, it really impacts people. Uh, and when you have lower growth in aggregate demand, we'll get a better balance of supply and demand in the economy. And that will mean less upward pressure on inflation. If inflation- well, would, we're going to get less, less upward pressure on inflation as uh, supply chains normalise and 
having a discussion with some of my builders uh, earlier this week, one of my concerns is that, and touching on some of your early comments about pricing before, many of them have faced significant prices, price increases on their inputs to building houses. Uh, yet they're saying those price increases are moderating or flattening out, but the prices aren't coming down. And that to me is a, is a huge concern in that we, we potentially are facing a situation where our, per, our cost base in our economy is now permanently higher. It's actually not going to come back down. And one of their big inputs, they said to me, is the cost of transport. Yep, and um, that's partly the higher cost of fuel, but it's also yep. been and partly the very strong demands on the transport system relative to the ability of the, the system to provide trucks and kind of rail. Um, so there's a, in many parts of the economy, the balance between demand supply has um, moved to a point where it's putting upward pressure on prices and higher interest rates will help recalibrate that, not in every sector, but in enough sectors. So the combination of the various um, factors you were talking about, the kind of improvements in the supply chain and maybe improvements in the agricultural sector and higher interest rates, together I think will bring inflation back down. And this is why I'm more confident than um, many of my peers in other central banks that Australia can navigate this narrow path to bring inflation back down without the economy slowing too much. We've got enough things going on, on the supply side and wages growth has not picked up too much here. So I can, think can I ask can, a, a yep. sorry. Yeah, no, you can I ahead. ask a follow on question yep. then from that in, in relation to to your assessment of, of the rate of inflation? Um, you know, we see often reported the headline rate of inflation, which I think in your August monetary statement was six point one percent. Um, but the tra trimmed mean average, I think, was about 4.9 from, from memory on, in your August report. What, what is the figure that you use to make a decision on what the interest rate increases should or should not be? Is it that headline number or is it that a, a different figure based on trying to filter out uh, these external shocks uh, some of which may might be one off or might carry through for a little bit longer, but be shorter term in nature than a, a structural long term structural change. Well, not surprisingly, we look at all the measures. The headline measure is important because it influences people's expectations of what inflation is going to be in the future. It's kind of the the thing that gets most media coverage. But the measures of underlying inflation are critically important because they give us a sense of what the ongoing momentum is. You know, if the price of oil is going up very quickly and the price of home buildings up very quickly, but other things in the economy are not kind of uh, rising in prices quickly, that's quite important. So the, the trimmed mean uh, trims out the price movements at the 15% yeah. at the ends of the, we rate all the, the price changes in the economy and we chop off the tails at the 15th percentile, both the upper tail and the bottom tail and look at the, um, the uh, inflation rate and the remaining items. The other measure we use is to look at the median. So we get the distribution of price changes and take out the middle of the distribution. So that, you know, we're looking at all these measures because we want to understand what the ongoing inflation momentum in the economy is. And at the moment, it's too high. It's considerably too high. And that's partly because demand is strong relative to supply. And higher interest rates are part of the way we get that back, balance back. And I know it hurts people, but it's going to hurt people more if we don't get the balance back. Thank you for that, Mr. Lowe. Can I Can I ask a, 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 a Another question in relation to that. What other tools do you have in your kit bag as the RBA, uh, other than interest rates, to lower the rate of inflation? And, and you mentioned in uh, response to an earlier question, might have been in your opening remarks, that, that you chair the uh, Council of Financial Regulators. Uh, so, what discussions would you have, say, with the likes of APRA about lending standards and access to finance uh, as alternative tools uh, 
to manage demand rather than the very blunt instrument of interest rates. Uh, well, the Reserve Bank really just has interest rates, except for in extreme <coughs> circumstances during the pandemic, we had other monetary policy tools, but they're not useful at the moment. Um, I don't think it would make sense to try and control growth in the economy at the moment by tightening up lending standards. You know, that would be, another, in, at least in principle, another possibility, wouldn't it, to say, well, we need growth and demand to be slower, so we're going to make it harder for businesses to get credit. I don't think that makes sense. Uh, the, um, the use of these credit-related tools was very important in the years when borrowing was growing very, very quickly particularly in the household sector, for some years I had been concerned that growth in household income was maybe 5% and growth in debt was 10. For one year or two years, that's probably okay, but we, it's a dangerous situation given the high level of debt. Mm. For growth in debt to be double that, at what it was in income, and that was the situation was we were facing. And so when that was <coughs> um, the situation of credit standards were deteriorating, we worked with APRA to make it a bit more difficult for people to get uh, mortgages. They have to hold bigger buffers. So that was the context in which APRA was using those tools. I don't think it makes sense to use them to slow the growth in the economy. We want businesses to be able to get access to credit so they can expand <coughs> and invest. And the demand for housing finance is um, moderating anyhow. Well, I, I mean, I don't have, uh, have an issue with um business having access to capital, but doesn't interest, increasing interest rates make access to capital more difficult for servicing perspective anyway. It's just a different way of dealing with the same issue. And uh, yeah, I, I would argue that we have an over-reliance on housing investment and finance in this country at the expense of business in, in many occasions, but that's a, a, a separate uh, discussion that we can have at another time. Uh, given we are facing at the end of September an increase in the fuel excise back to its, its full rate, and, and I've seen some commentary around that indicates that that may add a quarter of a percent to uh, the inflation rate uh, of the next measure. How, how will the Reserve Bank take that into account when considering future interest rate increases given that impact, potential impact on the inflation rate? In and of itself, it has no effect on, on monetary policy because um, by the time we go into next year, looking at the forecasts, uh, that, will have, that increase will have dropped out. So we're expecting inflation next year to be, what I think, handled in terms four and a quarter and the following year to be three. So the increase in the excise rate at the moment doesn't really, isn't going to affect the annual inflation rate next year in 2024. So we're really looking through that and I can certainly understand why the government is uh, is uh, committed to to um, reinstituting the previous rate of tax because we do face medium-term fiscal issues, and um, we you know we need to address that. So, but it's not going to affect monetary policy at all. Okay. Uh, fi final question around um, employment, and and you've touched on it a couple of times today in response to other questions. Uh, again, talking to local businesses uh, over the past few weeks, and one of the interesting things that I keep getting feedback on is, and where, where I agree with you, uh, employers are looking for staff. But one of the interesting pieces is that people aren't prepared to train staff or take on people on a work experience or other basis in a short term capacity to see whether they're uh, fit for the job or whether they're interested in those roles. What, if any, discussions are you having with the business community? And I remember when I started in, in the bank you know, 40, 30 odd, 40 years ago, um, the amount of training business did at that time compared to what a lot of businesses do today. What discussion are you having with the business community about their willingness to actually take a step back and start to train their workforce rather than trying to find people that are already ready and fit to go? Yeah, I'm glad you um, raised this because I have a lot of discussions with business people on this because they complain about the lack of skilled workers and I remind them 
And they often say, well, the government should do something about it. And I say, well, you should do something about it as well. And like you, I re recount my own experience. Um, I um, joined the Reserve Bank uh, from high school. It was in 1980. And at the time, the Reserve Bank couldn't hire economists. It wasn't kind of, you know, we were kind of administrative, considered an administrative arm of government. It wasn't a good place to be. So um, it said to people like me who did economics at high school, come and work for us and uh, go to university at night time. And if you do that, then um, we'll give you a kind of support to study and build up your school base. So um, a number of my colleagues uh, benefited from that. So the Reserve Bank invested. It was a tight labour market. We couldn't hire economists. So we invested in building people. Uh, that model went out and now, like other organisations, we go to the market, we hire a kind of fully trained economists, either from Australia or overseas. And, you know, we've gone, as a society, we've gone away from employers developing their own people to hiring them in the market, sometimes the international market. And I, I personally think that's a backward step. Uh, we need to get, at least to some degree, back to that world which it was when I entered the labour market, was fairly tight, that firms have to invest in their own people more. When there was, um, when we weren't at full employment and we could easily hire people overseas, it was very easy to go to the kind of the market to hire the people you want, but we're not in that world anymore. And <coughs> I, I always encourage people, business people, to think about training again, like they did when the labour market was tight previously. Thank you, Mr Lowe. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mr Van Manen. Uh, I'll hand over now to uh, Mr Luxile. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Governor, for your time today. Um, you'd be aware uh, of the term uh, housing stress or rental stress. How does the RBA define housing stress? I don't know that we've got a kind of formal definition, Brad. Uh, Brad's um, just recently taken over the financial stability area of the bank, so perhaps mm an opportunity to you talk and you're tracking various measures, would that be okay? And sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a couple of ways to think about this through both the, the rental lens and then the, the, um, the owner occupier lens. There's no doubt that um, on the rental side, households that are uh, having to renew their, their leases are facing very material increase in rents about 12% uh, annual increase in, in new advertised rents. The total stock of rents across the economy is growing at a, at a much slower pace. It's just because it takes time for these, uh, you know, only a small part of the rental market is turning over uh, at any point in time. So across the economy as a whole, uh, rents as measured in the CPI are increasing at about a 2% rate. But those who are facing resets are, are seeing very material uh, increases and what we know about the roughly one third of Australians who who rent, they tend to uh, be um, they tend to come from lower they tend to be lower income households. Uh, so not only are those households facing much higher rents, the share of their consumption devoted to essentials um, is also very high, relatively high, and we know that inflation in that essential basket is is increasing at a pretty solid clip. So for uh, low income households, those who rent, those who are facing rent resets, uh, there's no question that those households are, that there's a growing number of households that are feeling you know, real uh, strain on, on their household budgets. For owner occupiers, uh, the, the situation is much more nuanced. So there's a quite significant cohort of uh, of uh, household uh, borrowers um, who are uh, so far have not experienced uh, much of an uplift, if any, in fact, in their uh, in their loan repayments. In fact, um, we've done some some analysis, and this will be forthcoming in the financial stability report in a few weeks. Uh, if we, if we take the market implied uh, path for interest rates and also our inflation forecasts put that all together. Um, there's a very sizable cohort of households um, who are still going to have quite sizable saving uh, uh, spare cash flows, if you like. Um, so you've got about a third of households who are uh, of borrowers 
who are actually quite well placed to accommodate an increase in cost of living and borrowing costs. There's also a cohort at the other end of that distribution who have quite high debt um, and uh, they also, and very uh, little in the way of prepayment buffers, say less than three months worth of excess mortgage payments, um, also have, th those households tend to be disproportionate, the high debt, low buffer households tend to be the ones also that are disproportionately populated by low income households. And so they have less ability to, to trim their, their expenditure. And so, for instance, about 6%, to give you a number, about 6% of variable rate owner occupiers uh, are what we would classify as being uh, high debt, low buffer uh, households. And they're the ones where we're expecting um, uh, their, their ability to accumulate uh, uh, spare cash flow to basically evaporate over the next couple of years. Uh, they, they will still have some margin of adjustment um, households in aggregate have built up a lot of savings, lower income households less so. So there will be some ability to draw down on those savings, but there is certainly a tail uh, of households in the rental market and even in the owner occupier market that are gonna you know, find life um, more challenging mm. in the next sort of 12 to 18 months. Just on that uh, definition though, so the ABS, for example, would define someone in housing or rental stress where over 30% of the household's gross income is, is being used to pay. Is, is, that, is that sort of the ballpark? Is that, is that what the RBA that's, uses? That's, that's generally that's recognised? Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you're making a decision, you've increased rates five months in a row. Um, what consideration do you give to those who are experiencing housing stress when making these decisions? But uh, these, these facts that um, Brad's reported or just talked to get mm -hmm. discussed at the board and we'll have another extensive discussion of that uh, next month. So we're very cognizant of the fact that um, a lot of people are finding things very difficult at the moment. Uh, rents are going up, new rents are going up quite quickly for people and uh, there are a large number of people who have high debt and low buffers. Mm -hmm. So we know that that is very difficult for people. Yeah. Um, Mr. Jones, you mentioned uh, mortgage holders. Um, again, when you're around the board table making this decision um, to raise rates, um, would you sort of calculate the, a 25 basis points increase and say, well, that'll take X amount out of the family budget? Or um, is, is that how these decisions are made? You'd weigh up 50 point basis points, zero, 25, 75. Is that how you'd, well, we you'd get a figure? Well, we look at um what happens to um, interest payments relative to income mm. when we increase interest rates by certain amounts. And um, that's quite an important consideration. How, how big a buffers do people have mm -hmm. and how many people are going to be impacted by the higher interest rates? So we talk a lot about that. Okay. And I know, and I've said this before, it's very difficult for people, but it will be even, this is the point, it'll even be more difficult if inflation stays high. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, you don't like higher interest rates, so you understand that and it hurts. But having inflation high for a long period of time will mean higher interest rates and fewer jobs. And that will hurt a lot more. Mm. So I know it's unpleasant for this year, but I um, ask people to look through this year and if we can manage this successfully, then we can look forward next year with rising real wages again. Australians having jobs at rates they haven't had in many, many years and being able to get the hours they work, young kids having jobs and female and participation rising and participation by older Australians. So I know this year is very difficult, mm. particularly for people without buffers, but if we manage this well as a country, we can look forward to um, prosperity again. Okay. And we can put that at risk though, if we say, well, it's all too hard, we don't want to cause any pain for anyone, we'll put that at risk. Mm. I'd like to separate mortgage holders and renters, um, if that's okay. Um, there's always a lot of analysis in the public domain on, on how rate rises impact uh, mortgage holders. You know, um, uh, <coughs> figures always come out in a news article that say on a million dollar loan, you're paying an extra $288, you know, very simple analysis. Yeah. And I would imagine they'd be the same figures you use that you just yeah. told us. Um, so how does the RBA measure the impact of rate rises on renters? 
on rent. I, most of the time, it doesn't have a um, direct impact on on rent. Some some lum, some landlords have recently been saying that um, higher interest rates going to lead to higher rents because they've got higher costs of financing and they're going to pass that through into um, rents in a in a tight uh, rental market. So some some say that. I don't think that's a first order effect on inflation. Mm. You've uh, just had Mr. Jones say. Yep, we're seeing 12% increases and at the time when yep. interest rates have been increased. Are you saying they're not related? Uh, if they're related, it's only very marginal. The rents are rising quickly, not because interest rates are going up, but the rental market's tight. Mm. You know, it had been... Um, and, re and remember, during the pandemic, many landlords did not put their rents up and some even gave kind of rent holidays to people. That was part of the kind of the social contract that was constructed. Uh, now that the pandemic is, let's hope, behind us, the rental market's tight and uh, there's some catch-up going on. And it's, it's, it's difficult for people. I don't, it's not higher interest rates that are driving higher rent, it's the tightness in the rental market. I might also yeah. just add briefly there that um, um, there's been changes in household formation in this period. So uh, you might remember in the pandemic, in fact, the vacancy rates for rent went up. Um, because people moved home, people lost jobs, um, and share houses were disbanded. And I think what we're observing now is a little bit of a switch in the way people want to live. If you're going to rent, you might rent with a smaller group of people. You might rent with only one other people rather than shared houses. So there's a supply-demand thing going on here which goes to the point sure, that but Phil's making. There's supply-demand for mortgage holders as well. Mm -hmm. So, again, um, I'll just read a quote from an article from Nine News, which is titled, it's a pretty um, aggressive title, Australia facing, is facing a $158 billion mortgage time bomb. And this is from the 13th of September by Nick Pearson. He's got analysis here that says, since May, when the cash rate was now a long forgotten 0.1%, that represents an increase of more than $600 a month for those with a $500,000 loan and an eye-watering five-month increase of more than $1,200 for those with more than a million dollars owing on their mortgage. A again, I asked Governor, what is the impact of a 225 basis point increase on renters? I think the increase, it's not particularly um, large. There'll be some flow through to some renters because some landlords will put their um, rents up because of higher interest rates, but uh, don't, it's, not, it's not a first order effect. Right. Yep. So in my electorate of Benelong, 40%. Um, yep of uh, ten tenancies is those in the are renters. Yep. Um, in nearby Parramatta, where Dr Charlton is, it's 45%. Yep. Um, in New South Wales, renting has overtaken mortgage uh, owners yep. for, the, for the first time in the 10 years that I've looked back. Um, so you're saying that these interest rate rises have had little impact on 40% in of those in my electorate, on, the, on, on their ability I'm and not, on their no, rent I mean, prices. For some, some people, obviously, it's had an impact, but it's mm. not... The, the, the fact that people are paying higher rents at the moment isn't because of higher interest rates, it's because of these structural factors. You know, people want more floor space when they're working from home, so the demand for floor space has increased, and that puts pressure in the market. I think that's the primary thing that's going on here. And uh, the addition to supply of new apartments was is um, the last year or two has been fairly small, and the demand for apartments floor space is rising again because people work from home. Mm. So that's the thing that's going on. If we want to address um, high rental costs, the solution isn't interest rates; it's more supply. Kind of part mm. of what we were talking about as well. It's more supply, changing planning um, arrangements, and probably even on tax as well. So. I know interest rates get blamed for lots of things, but I don't think we should be blamed for higher rents if for can, most people. If I could just, <laughs> just to give yeah. some, um, some substance to that point, we have looked very uh, closely empirically at, at the first order drivers of rents and the two, and the two variables that, that jump out there are incomes and the vacancy rate. So while household incomes are growing strongly as they have been and the vacancy rate is low, nationally below 1%, about as low as we've seen in some parts of regional Australia, even lower. While you've got rising incomes and a, and a vacancy rate below 1%, the inevitable outcome is, is going to be 
uh, new advertised rents increasing mm -hmm. at, a, at a very solid rate, and that's what we've been uh, observing. Just finally, you said in um, a previous answer that you give great consideration, um, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, to um, you know, the increased mortgage repayments. Yeah. And from what I'm hearing is that you don't give that much consideration to the same but for renters. Is that, is that a fair no, assessment? We're, we're understanding, we spend a lot of time trying to understand the pressure on household budgets and rents for many people is a very significant share of their budgets, you know. So when we're trying, when we're understanding the pressures on household finances, we pay a lot of attention to rentals. And that's why Brad had these figures on. Okay, well, you've got a dollar figure so, for a mortgage increase. Where's, yeah. where's the analysis for rents? I, I don't well, understand I just don't why. Think can we go back to the same point? I don't, don't think there is much of a link between when we increase rates by 50 basis points and uh, what people pay in rents tomorrow. Mm. Many rental contracts are for one year, and so the flow through is, um, is um, slow, and many, um, many landlords don't put up their rentals just because um, interest rates are going up. Okay. So I just, it's, I'm not denying that it's kind of interest rates are an influence on rents, but I just don't think they're a first order influence for most rentals. Okay, one final question. Um, it was reported, reported yesterday in the Sydney Morning Herald um, of the current non-executive board members appointed uh, by the former treasurer, Josh Feidenberg, or his predecessor, Scott Morrison, that only, and I quote, only one is a trained economist. Um, Mr Lowe, in your personal and professional view, do you believe that's appropriate? Well, I'd, I would question um, the facts as, as reported there. Okay. Um, uh, I'm a trained economist. Michelle. No, out of the non executive uh, board members. Uh, Stephen Kennedy, the Treasury Secretary, is a trained economist. Uh, Professor Ian Harper, obviously a trained economist. So we've now we've got already four. Uh, so Carolyn Hewson. You know, she's very extensive experience in banking, finance, economics. And Mark okay. Barnaba um, has um, uh, training in economics as well. So I'd, I'd, I'd push back on the fact okay. that the board doesn't have um, economic training. It doesn't have um, uh, many professors of economics, if that's the point. But you don't need to be a professor of economics to understand economics and monetary policy. It helps, but you don't need those qualifications. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. I'll hand over to Mr. Wallahan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, after the job summit, the government flagged an increase in migration to 195,000 per annum. I um, just have a four-part question. Uh, have you modelled that? What is the impact on employment or unemployment? What is the impact on inflation? And then finally, the impact on rent and house prices. Good questions. Um, well, perhaps I can share my kind of perspectives here. Um, I think opening up the borders again and having um, immigration regime is incredibly important for the country's longer run prospects. So this is, I think, about um, immigration, that Australia has benefited hugely from immigration. Almost 50% of the population were born overseas or have one parent who was born overseas. It's brought a dynamism to our country that very few other Western countries have. So I think it's one of our key national assets. So that's how I think about kind of immigration. It's, it's, it's the long-term benefits we get from it rather than the, in the short term. But in the short term, from my perspective, the focus needs to be on getting people with skills that are in short supply. As I hear many businesses say they want to expand, they want to invest, but they can't get the people to do the expansion and the investment. And that's creating bottlenecks in the economy. And if we can blast through those bottlenecks with more people, we'll have higher output and higher income. So we need to focus on um, skills. I'm not sure that uh, higher immigration has much effect on the unemployment rate. On the f on, if you think about it in the kind of the perspective of an individual business, it's pretty clear you kind of you can't uh, undertake. Uh, an investment, you can't hire a worker, so you get a worker from overseas and things look better for you, and the labour market constraints ease. But when that worker is finished working for you, they go home, they've got to live somewhere, they've got to eat, they go to the doctor, 
they go out and entertain themselves, maybe their children need to get educated, and when they do all those things, that creates additional demand for labour. So the worker comes in and supplies more labour for the firm, but when they go home, they create extra demand for labour in the economy. So at an aggregate level, I don't think uh, immigration uh, really is going to make that much of an effect on the overall dynamics in the labour market or the unemployment rate. But it's incredibly important in delivering skills to people, for businesses, and for the longer run prospects for the country. So I don't think it really has much effect on inflation or unemployment in the short run, other than to the extent it can ease the supply bottlenecks and because you get people with the right skills. Thank you. I want to take you to an answer you gave um, Ms Spender about housing affordability. Um, you, you downplayed the role of interest rates, and um, I'm sorry if I verbal you, but I, I yep. wrote down you said there isn't anything to do with the Reserve Bank or interest rates. I apologise if I've got sorry, that Sorry, can I just interrupt? Because I said yeah. the high level, the structural, yeah. um, the fact we've got kind of structurally high housing prices isn't doing anything with the Reserve Bank. I, full responsibility for the cycle around sure. that high level. Sorry. No, that's all right. Yep. yep. Um, there's a 2019 RBA discussion paper written by Trent Saunders and Peter Tulip. It's titled A Model of the Australian Housing Market. And in the abstract, it says, we find that low interest rates explain much of the rapid growth in housing prices and construction over the past few years. How do you reconcile that abstract with what you've given today? Yeah, that's, uh, I think there, um, and Lucy can come in here if it's helpful. Um, they were talking about the decline in real interest rates which isn't something the Reserve Bank, I mean, we're the ones who actually you know, deliver the level of interest rates, but we're really responding to broader forces which have levered lower real interest rates in the global economy. And um, when you have lower real interest rates, all asset prices go up. And that's, that's what um, I think they're referring yeah, to. It's so the lower real rates coming <coughs> from global developments. And again, while we get the blame for that, we're just the institution that's delivering the lower nominal interest rates because of what's happened in the yeah. globe. So, so yeah, I'm just to, to expand on that. Um, so the past few years, so there's the cyclical piece. So that's you know, the bit we're claiming responsibility for. Uh, and that's actually what they're talking about there is, you know, explained, you know, there was a cyclical increase in uh, um, prices in that sort of more recent period. Uh, but Phil's also right that there is, you know, th there are two things going on. Uh, in the long term as well. And one is that the, the decline in nominal and real interest rates over multiple decades, primarily in the 90s, did mean that there was a level shift in the house, in <coughs> ratio of houses prices to income. Uh, that doesn't actually change affordability. Uh, and you know, this is long-standing economics, back to Modigliani, and we've written about this many, many times. But essentially, if because inflation is lower and because the, the, the equilibrium real interest rate is lower for global reasons, uh, that means you can service a bigger mortgage on the same repayment. So in that sense, housing affordability hasn't changed, but it maps into a higher price. So that was a one-off level shift. That was mostly completed by about 04, 05. And you know, it, it's, you know, what we've seen since then has been mostly cycling around you know, a new higher level in relation to, uh, in, in relation to income. Uh, and even more so that once you adjust for the offset accounts, actually the household debt to income ratio has been pretty, uh, uh, pretty constant since about 2005. Uh, so in that sense, there was a level shift, uh, which is explained by interest rates because nominal interest rates and real interest rates both came down, disinflation and deregulation, all of the, the downward forces on the neutral real interest rate uh, play into that. And then the other component is, yes, uh, the cyclical movement of interest rates does have a large bearing on the cyclical movement of housing prices around their longer term trend. Mm. Uh, Governor, you've been quite frank today on the need for structural reform, so thank you for that, um, particularly in terms of productivity. I'm interested in your views on the rates of home ownership, particularly for Australia's largest generation, often called millennials, those born between 1981 and 1996. Um, how, how do you see us increasing the percentage of millennials owning homes? How do I see us doing it? I see it. It's going to be pretty challenging. Mm. I think it, for that to happen, well, uh, it requires, I think, a lower level of housing prices relative to people's income. 
for housing prices to grow more slowly than income for a while to make it more feasible for young people to buy housing. And uh, that comes back to the structural policies that I talked about before. It's um, urban design, the type of dwellings that uh, we build, perhaps the tax arrangements, the transport system. Because one reason we have a high value of land embedded in dwellings is because we've underinvested in transport. And transport can increase the supply of well-located land. That's what it does. And if you increase the supply of well-located land, the value of land embedded in any particular dwelling will be lower. So in previous committees, I've talked about the best housing policies are transport policy. It's tax, transport, and um, urban design. And I think if we're really serious about lowering the cost of housing relative to income, they're the things we've got to tackle. Interest rates, you know, we raise them for a while and in housing prices come down so it's a bit more affordable, but it's not a sustainable solution is it? because it's just cycling around this higher level. And the other um, dynamic that's playing out, as you know, is the bank of mum and dad, where effectively houses get passed from generation to generation, which is fine if you um, can access the bank of mum and dad and your parents kind of pass the house or income through to you. But there are many Australians who aren't in a position to do that. So I, not as the central bank governor, but as a, an Australian, I worry a lot about that, that we're reinforcing making worse the existing distribution of wealth in society through the housing market. And so the inability to address uh, zoning, taxation and transport has really, I think, negative effects, longer term effects on the society. But yeah, that's not my day job, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that. <laughs> thank you, I think that's becoming our day job. So <laughs> um, Further to Mr Van Manen's question on APRA and inflation. I just had a, yep. a slightly different take on, an, on APRA. Um, it's a narrower question. Uh, APRA required retail banks to include buffers for new mortgages to ensure that unsustainable loans weren't issued during yep. the COVID era interest rates. Um, those buffers are now appearing to be modest. Do you think they were sufficient? And do you think further upward revision for new loans is required? Do you mind if I ask Michelle to it's answer fine. that question because that was kind of her yeah. area of the bank sure. up until recently? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the mortgage serviceability buffer that was, um, so the, the way APRA, um, like the banks, or require the banks to operate is to have a floor serviceability rate, if you like. So um, when interest rates were really low, banks were effectively saying, required to say, could they still pay it back at a much higher interest rate? The buffer was 2.5, then they raised it to three, APRA raised it to three. Three is around about what other countries have in terms of these sorts of serviceability buffers. Um, and what we're observing now, of course, as interest rates rise, is that the serviceability buffer is on top of a higher interest rate. So I don't think there's a suggestion that we need an even higher buffer. I think the buffer is, is or the serviceability buffer is, is um, providing what's required. Um, and it's worked in the past in the sense that, as we discussed earlier, um, many households, even though interest rates have gone up, not all households, but many households have found they do have space because the space was built in in the first place. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just want to go to the role of fiscal and monetary policy. Um, what would be the result, and it's to the, you, Governor, uh, what would be the result of tightening monetary policy as we're doing, uh, but increasing fiscal expenditure. Um, how do you think that would play out in terms of inflation? Well, it would all depend upon the degree, wouldn't it? I mean, we're tightening monetary policy, but if there was a very significant fiscal expansion now, mm -hmm. that would put uh, more pressure on aggregate demand. And the conversation we we're having before was um, stronger aggregate demands putting upward pressure on prices. So um, that would mean higher interest rates, but it really talks about the degree. Sure. Yeah, how much extra fiscal stimulus might or might not be given. But Will they be pulling know, and pushing against each other? If it, I mean, hypothetically, they could, couldn't mm. they? But I, I don't want to speculate what's in the budget, but there's a state of the world uh, where fiscal developments aren't helpful for us, but I'm not predicting that state of the world, but conceptually it's possible, isn't it? it um, let's hope we don't find ourselves in that state of the world. That isn't to say that um, there can't be some measures to alleviate the cost of living pressures that households are 
a feeling within the budget envelope, but uh, we're tightening interest rates, so it'd be unhelpful to have fiscal expansion. Thank you. And just one final question, Chair, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen um, globalisation get wound back for a variety of reasons, and um, globalisation has an and integration has been a deflationary force for some time. Um, how do you see that playing out long term in terms of inflation? Well, long term inflation is determined by central banks. Our job will be easier or harder depending upon what's um, going on in the global economy. In the last 20 years, globalisation, increased global supply from China made our jobs a bit easier. So if that trend reverses and productivity growth is low, our job's going to be harder. So it's not just deglobalisation, it's um, slower productivity growth and the demographics. Those things all mean slower growth in our real incomes. And our job of containing inflation is probably a bit harder, but ultimately the central banks determine the rate of inflation. Thank you, Governor, and thank okay. you, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'll hand over now to Ms Payne. Uh, thank you, Governor, and each of you for your time today and the opportunity to ask you some questions. Um, I wanted to go to distributional impacts of, um, of the rate rises. And, um, Governor, you indicated in a speech on the 8th of September that there's an uneven effect across the economy and that the Reserve Bank spends a lot of time looking at disaggregated data to understand that. So I was wondering if you could um, elaborate on that uh, uneven uh, impact on households and explain which data and how you analyse that. I might ask Brad in a minute to kind of touch on some of that, but, but just before I do, can I make a, a more general point about income distribution? The, the best thing for people is to have a job. So I know there's a lot of focus at the moment on the effect of higher interest rates on people, and I understand why that is, but a higher share of Australians have a job today than ever before. Female participation rate is the highest it's ever been. Youth unemployment's the lowest in many, many decades. People are getting the hours of work they want. They might have to work two jobs, but they're getting hours of work. So they are fantastic things for people's income and opportunity. And those things are the result of the monetary and fiscal response during the pandemic. So I know we're looking at the other side of this as interest rates increase, but we shouldn't forget that from an income distribution and a welfare, from the perspective of welfare society, we're in a much, much better place than we've been for a long time. So that was a, just, I think it's kind of just important contextual information. I understand that everyone's very concerned about higher interest rates now, but you know, we should be welcoming and celebrating full employment. And I don't hear enough, not, not you, but I don't hear enough in our society celebrating, welcoming, Full employment. Sorry, Brad. Uh, you know the data we're using. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a whole range of metrics, and in fact, Lucy's team has also a bit earlier this year did a deep dive into income and wealth inequality in Australia. So I'm not sure if Lucy wanted to speak to that uh, in a moment. Maybe maybe if I can just um, uh, give a, f a few quick remarks around what's changed over the course of the pandemic uh, in terms of the distribution of. Uh, in particular of, of savings. So um, as the governor mentioned a little earlier, in aggregate, the country has accumulated actually a little north of $250 billion, but that accumulation of excess savings has not fallen evenly. Um, the numbers that, uh, uh, that we monitor suggest that about 80% of that extra $270 billion has gone to the top 40% uh, of households by income. Um, that experience is not unusual by international standards when we look at the experience in the US, the UK, other things. That most of the run-up in excess savings during the pandemic went to higher income households, in large part because their uh, consumption of discretionary goods, ability to travel and the, these sort of things was, was severely uh, uh, curtailed. Um, so big aggregate increase in, in liquid savings, but most of it's gone to higher income households um, is, is the first point. <coughs> On the wealth side, I just point out the aggregate uh, increase in, in household net wealth in the country since the pandemic has been about $3 trillion. It actually dwarfs the run up in liquid savings that, that we've seen. Um, and again, uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, 
a fair chunk of that has gone to um, higher income households. Um, if I can just make uh, one point about how we see um, some of the, the stresses coming down the line from a disaggregated perspective, because to your, your earlier point, yes, we look at the aggregates. It's been a lot of time we form policy on the base of aggregates, but we are very, very attentive to um, how, um, how uh, household finances are, are tracking at a disaggregated level. Um, when we do scenario analysis, forward-looking scenario analysis, trying to get a handle on what sort of impact could um, uh, uh, future interest rate increases and, and increases in the cost of living have out to the end of next year. What we find is about 15% of borrowers are going to have their spare cash flows fully taken up by the increase in borrowing costs and the increases in the cost of living. Other households will have other margins of adjustment. They might be able to curtail consumption, discretionary consumption a little, or run down buffers, but about 15% of borrowers are not gonna have any spare saving each month uh, if the market path for interest rates and if our inflation um, profile is borne out. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, about one third of borrowers, both fixed rate and variable rate borrowers, are not going to have any increase um, in their uh, in their require in their in their payment in their actual realised payments out to the end of next year. In the case of variable rate borrowers, it's because they've been prepaying to such a degree that even as interest rates go up, uh, they're already they're they're already uh, uh, servicing a mortgage at a rate that it, that it kind of can fully absorb that increase in interest rates. Um, so there is a very uneven impact. Um, coming at us from both uh, rising interest rates and uh, and rising cost of living. Uh, Lucy, if you wanted to give a bit more colour on the yeah, inequality sure. side. I mean, in terms of the, the various data sets that we have available, of course, there's a HILDA survey that we have 20 years of experience with. Uh, the, household, the, the ABS uh, contributes quite a lot of uh, useful information on this, including the Household ex in Income Expenditure Survey, so the, or the Survey of um, uh, Employment and um, Expenditure and Housing. Uh, we use surveys to get some colour on this. So some of you know, some of the analysis that we've done on you know who ended up with the extra savings during the pandemic period that was partly based on uh, various commercial surveys uh, that we uh, have access to. Uh, so there's a range of different things. But I think the other point I'd make is the liaison. So in terms of how this is actually affecting people's experience. So we say we talk to all the retailers every month. And so, you know, if the retailers that are mainly targeted at low income um, earners are telling us a very different story to the ones who are perhaps more at the high end or in the mid, uh, middle market, that's telling us something. We also liaise with uh, groups like financial, the financial counsellors networks and the debt collectors. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you the debt collectors were bored during the pandemic mm -hmm. because there was just so much support an awful lot of the government support went to relatively low income earners. And there were a number of people, particularly young people, who were actually receiving more income you know, during the lockdown periods than they were when they were working. Mm. So uh, these are all sources of information that we have. Mm. Well, that, that's very interesting. So just to go to you, you mentioned the retailers targeting low income yeah. consumers tell a different story. What what well, story if that would they... happen. I'm not saying that that is what's happening, and obviously I can't talk about specific liaison contacts because it's all commercial in confidence. But the fact that we talk to, you know, all of them every month, you know, some of the major retailers, uh, and some of those have different target markets. And so if we were to hear, what, you know, the ones who mainly target lower income spenders, uh, and if they were saying something very different, that's, this is a hypothetical. If they were saying something very different to, you know, the ones who are, you know, high-end furnishings or much more discretionary, that's telling us something about where the impact of the various uh, economic forces is lying. So we have a range of different information to triangulate, and that would be a very timely indicator. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go now to climate disclosures, and uh, obviously the um, RBA have advocated for a clear climate disclosure policy. So I was just interested um, how Australia compares internationally um, and how 
our current approach um, to climate disclosure, how that impacts on the availability of capital for the transition to net zero? Good question. Uh, well, there are standards being developed um, internationally, which uh, the intention is they sit alongside the, the international accounting standards. There'll be international climate sustainability standards, and um, Australia is going to need to find a way to implement those here. Yeah. And um, I think the government has a role to play there, and businesses also have a role to play. Um, uh, if we don't do that, we'll fall behind what international investors expect. So regardless of whether you think this is a good or bad thing, the investors want it. And if we don't do it, then uh, they will be reluctant to invest in Australian businesses. So it's important that we keep pace with what's going on internationally and uh, we're working through the Council of Financial Regulators and with the government to hope make sure that happens. It's, I think it's a really important issue. Thanks. And could you comment on what the impact of the um, government legislating our climate targets has will have on that. Uh, well, I think it was in well the legislature. I'm not. I don't, I don't know enough about kind of um, uh, the details, but the fact that Australia committed to net zero by uh, 2050 was incredibly important because I've had a lot of discussions with overseas central banks and investors, and they are always asking about Australia's commitment. Mm. And the fact that we had not signed up was people saying, well, are you really serious about this? We want this. Uh, do we want to invest in Australia? So it was a question mark that was always being raised. And that question mark isn't being raised in discussions we're having investors at the moment. I, I'm not sure whether the legislating it was kind of critical there, but the fact that we committed to it was, was important. And Australia has you know, great potential here with um, clean energy. And we're now in a better position to sell that story and to execute it when we're kind of seen to be on the same path that everyone else was. When we're on a different path, people were kind of, well, are they really serious? And it was damaging us. Thank you very much. Um, I'll leave it there, Chair. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, now, we have a couple of minutes, and I think the Deputy Chair has one uh, last quick question. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, highly summarise, if we accept uh, from the, the conversation today, the RBA's view, highly summarised. You're not the yep. big bad wolf. Um, this isn't the result of uh, some tumultuous bug wrap, the series of rate rises we've seen. Highly summarised, I accept. Yep. What does good decision making look like uh, in the future? What are we looking for um, to give us that confidence that you discussed uh, in, in your early statement? What, what, what does that look like? What does, what does good a good decision make? Yeah, well, I can tell you what a good outcome looks like, that inflation gradually comes down and the unemployment rate sits kind of not much different from 4% and that real wages start rising again. And We've I think seen the signals before that, though. I mean, what, so, I guess I am... Yep. It is in that decision-making space that I think is the, the crux of that confidence. Um, that we've well, discussed. the decisions... Are, I'm struggling with to kind of come up with an answer because I'm not quite sure what the question is. Uh, I mean, the Reserve Bank Board will, um, you know, meets each month and goes through all these considerations we've been talking about, the global situation, the pricing and wage dynamics in the economy, what's going on with households. And, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time, as we have at this hearing, talking about what's going on at uh, the individual household level and how various parts of the community are um, being affected. So good decision-making looks, I think, a continuation of that, putting these various factors together and trying to make what I'd say are very difficult decisions that affect people unequally. And we know we're making some people very unhappy. And we've got to keep in mind the, the kind of the prize here at the end, and the prize is low and stable inflation, full employment and rising real wages. And I think that prize is in grasp. But, you know, before we get it, there's some pain and it's difficult. So good decision making, I think, kind of puts all that together and we deliberate and explain every single month. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, thank you all for appearing here today. Um, the committee secretary will be in touch with you in relation to any matters arising out of today's hearing. You'll be sent a copy of the transcript of your evidence and we'll have an opportunity to request corrections to any transcription errors. I'd like to thank all of the witnesses and members uh, for their time today, uh, and I declare this hearing closed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.